Well, here we are with Cyrus Lakdawalla. So thank you for uh, taking the time to talk some chess. Thanks for talking to me. So I want to tell you the story of, of when we first met because you don't remember the story of it. So no. w what happened was, I think we, we played in a rapid tournament. What, and we played? Yeah, we played. I have no memory of that. Yeah, we, we, we played in a rapid tournament. I played, yeah. I played E4. And I was expecting that you were going to play the win R because I remember you had been talking about this win R line, like where you pull your bishop back to F8, something like that. Right, right. And, right, and right. you were like, and, th and, and I, I asked you, why, why are you playing this bishop F8 line? You said, oh, well, I like to play 60 move games and really tire my opponents out. Or you played, said something like that at the time. Oh, okay. and, and I was like, wow, I've never met anybody who plays like that. And, and so what happened was you played the Karo Khan against me. And I played the sharpest line with knight c3 and g4. We got a really wild position on the board. Uh, I had a winning position. I have like zero memory of this. Like, yeah. I don't remember the game. I don't remember you until today. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm, I'm going senile. This is the problem. You know? <laughs> so what happened was I, I, got, I, I actually got really great attacking positions with that knight c3, g4 line. Nowadays, it's kind of like people have sort of figured it out. Right. Right. But at the time, you could really catch some people out. I mean, I caught some 2,500 players out when I was 2,100 with that line just because it was so sharp. And I think a lot of Karo Khan players weren't really prepared for how the game would get out of control. And I, right. I sort of feel like the Karo Khan, a lot of the time, you try to control the position a bit. And once it's just wild, that's just not always the style they wanted in. But anyway, I got a great attack. It should have been winning. I failed to convert, and I lost the game. And then, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, well, what tournaments were you playing around that time of two thousand seven? Uh, wow, it had to be rapid because I pretty much retired from slow chess. I think what happened was I, I, had I very bad back, so I only played one day tournaments. So, so did so did you go to Vegas just to play rapid? Oh no. Okay, here's the deal. Okay, my wife. Uh, uses these tournaments as excuses to get the, the hotel rate and go on vacations. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, like, like to to you know to make it a business expense, I have to grudgingly <laughs> waste time and play in the freaking blitz or the oh, okay. or whatever. And so I eat up like one day or, or half a day uh -huh. or whatever. And I do it just to get the hotel rate and to mark off my taxes. Yeah. Here. So that's why. It, it, like, basically, I was on vacation. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Although I can't stand Vegas. Like, it's like, it's the worst. Uh, for me, I, I live this monk-like life. Like, like monks don't like Vegas. Right? Yeah. Like, okay, uh, no, I don't drink. I uh -huh. don't smoke. Uh, Mary, don't fool around. Uh, vegan can't have the buffet. Is mm -hmm. I don't want to pay, you know, um, I don't want to pay like fifteen bucks and then eat a cucumber. Yeah. So it's like it, the shows are stupid. Uh, uh -huh. I, like why am I in Vegas? Why yeah. My wife forces me. That's why. Yeah, yeah. Well, last time I was in Vegas, uh, actually, when I was in Vegas, I wasn't old enough to drink and I don't smoke. Oh, right? So I was just walking around as there were a lot of drunk people. People were throwing eggs and stuff, throwing bot, you know, every just a lot of crazy people around. And you're just like, you're just running to your hotel room, like, will I make it? You know, it's, it's like a game of Froggers. It's just really, really a crazy experience. Yeah. 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 Yeah, maybe I needed more practice in that for my trips to Vegas. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no. Uh, no Frogger, in fact. Like, that that was a game back in the, popular in the early 80s. Yeah. <laughs> Late 70s, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, I, I went to Vegas. I think I played two tournaments in there. And basically what happened was, well, I saw a lot of play. Like, the nice thing was, at least at that time, you could kind of, I felt like you could just kind of go and talk to everybody. So I would be like talking to Nakamura, I'd talk, be talking to Akobian, Gurevich, everybody. And so after after we played this rapid game, I was like talking to Akobian, and then I, then we, I was talking to you for like 10 minutes in between the rounds. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, so, it, it, and yeah, I... No memory, no memory. Yeah, I think you didn't remember me because I wasn't the titled player. I was just, you know... No, that's not it. I just don't remember a damn thing anymore. Mm. It's like, you know, it's... Yeah. Old age. 
know? Yeah, well, I, I, I think my rating might have been, I don't even remember, it might have been like 2000 or 1900 or something. Okay. And so, you know, I was just kind of, uh, nobody knew who I and was. Yeah, became an IM. Since yeah, I, I became an IM. That's yeah, I, I, I basically went on a, I was really, really lucky that uh, a Spanish IM was like, oh, do you want to come play on a Spanish team out here? You can uh, stay in a hotel here for free or stay in an apartment for free with two GMs. So I went to go live with two GMs and they were basically just playing the acoustic guitar, or smoking all day. They weren't really doing any chess. And they're like, wow, you study chess so much. And I was like, oh, well, I mean, I kind of have to. Otherwise, I won't get better. <laughs> I, I mean, am I just going to sit out here in Spain and just not study chess? <laughs> so so I, I was there, and it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, you know, what's so crazy is, you know, I mentioned uh, playing. Uh, so I think Emery Tate was at the same tournament that I, I met you at. And what happened was I lost an amazing game to him. And he was, oh. pa he was passing out a pamphlet with... Uh, Kislik Tate zero one a double exclamation mark move on the cover of it as people were. I played him one time, okay, and it was this insane game, and he came up with this absolutely brilliant sacrifice. Somehow, miraculously, I kind of like uh, survived won the same game as I won against you, the one you're describing. Yeah, where I'm yeah. Losing, but weasel. Win out. Winning ugly in chess, right? Exactly. <laughs> and so I weaseled out, and. Uh, I, after the game, you know, like, uh, I said, uh, your, you know, your sacrifice was quite brilliant. He went, no, no, <laughs> not brilliant. It was extraordinary. <laughs> I'm going, you know, WTF? Like, you know, well, the, the, the thing is, uh, the thing is, I think, I think Emery Tate was somebody who, who grows on you. If you were, if you knew him, like, I, so I, I met him in, on two continents in three different countries. Uh -huh. And I would just see him places, and I was like, "Why is he here?" You know, and and he never told me why. But but uh, you know, uh, actually, he's part of the reason why I was able to stay in Europe because right? I, I was playing in Spain, and there were some young Norwegian players, and he was giving a lesson to one of them, and he and he was like, "Hey, Eric, can I borrow your chess set?" And I was like, "Okay, sure." And what happened was uh, he didn't give me the chess set back. And so right. what, what, what I had to do was at the beginning of the, one of the rounds, they started the round. They're like, well, Emery Tate, please give Eric Kislik his chess set back. <laughs> and, and the thing is, I, I always loved Emery Tate, actually. This isn't like a negative thing. He was really funny. Chess players are. Oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. He, he was, okay. and yeah, I, I, what was amazing was how, like, so he, he just, uh, he was giving a lesson to these young players. And what ended up happening was I, I got in contact with those players because of the contact he had with them. And so then I stayed with one of them at his house in Norway. And so amazingly, I was able to find a way to stay in Europe with no money, basically. And then a Norwegian guy was like, oh, uh, do you want to coach me? And, and I'm going to play in Budapest. So that's how things kind of cross directions. I had to... I went back to New York City. I was working with my uncle for a few months, and then I came back to Europe, and then I stayed with the Norwegian player, and then another Norwegian player took me to Budapest. So ended up in a weird way, but yeah, actually, almost everybody I know has uh, has interesting games. Did, do you still have your game against Tate? Uh, I probably lost it. I know I played a modern. Uh, it, the game went e4, g6, d4, d6. Knight C3, C6. Oh. It's my anti... Uh, I just finished a book on the modern for uh, uh, Everyman, and, and it's were, not out yet. Were, were, you, not were, out. You, were you showing your own games in there, or...? Oh, yeah, I, I showed, oh. like, about 20% uh, maybe of the book. Oh, okay. I, I try to, 15, 20% of the book I always try to show. I put in, like, maybe five games, mm -hmm. you know, like, of my own out of 60, oh. or 65 games. But, uh... That was my anti. Uh, I figured Tate would play Austrian attack against them, and so on F4 I wanted to play D5 and clog them up <laughs> with E5. So All oh, right, I, right. I, I'm in a Gurgenitz position yeah. to move down in that position. Ah, uh, right? uh huh. Because my bishop is on F8, but not G7. Ah, uh, but that's so, that has some benefits too, though. It, that's the thing. You're actually a move up because the bishop is crappy on G7, mm, and mm -hmm. you play E. 
you get rid of your light squared bishop, you play e6, and then c5, and you turn it into a French yeah. without a bad bishop. And so because you're down a move, you're up a move. You yeah, know? I always found those Gurganid's positions very, very awkward to play with white if you lose control of the position a little bit. Because in a strange way, you could sometimes end up worse quickly if you misplayed it. Uh, I win with it a lot. Like those, I, I win with most block positions like a lot. I, I would assume that's very good for blitz and rapid, especially where people get confused and play natural moves. Yeah, because the natural moves are often wrong. It sounds like we have completely, absolutely like uh, polar opposite styles. Because like, like I mean. I, like you said, you played that crazy uh, against my Karakhan, that Nazi. Oh, I don't play that anymore. I don't play that anymore. No, but I mean, the fact that you played it one game <laughs> in your whole life. Yeah. It was like, oh my God, this guy's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> well, at the time, I was playing I was playing G4 in basically everything. So what happened was I, I played Rook G1 in the Nidorf. And a lot of people don't remember Rook G1 in the Nidorf is famous because even Chuk beat Kasparov with it. And so that move was popular for, for a very short amount of time. And so th it was totally solved. You have, you, no, no one has seen it for about five or 10 years, but I, I was playing it and I, I got a winning position in maybe like nine moves against uh, an FM, you know, not that long ago. And by the way- You caught him because it wasn't popular. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, 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 speaking of games that we can't remember and we can't find, I, I had a game once, I think it might have been at the same tournament where I met you, but I had a game against Michael Rode once where I had the most amazing maneuver I've ever seen. I had my queen on a1, and it went from a8 to h8 to h1. I went to every corner of the board with the queen. Oh, cool. And Ready? He's so proud of you. I know, but you know what? Ready, yeah. So, so like what happened was my, my laptop, uh, I, I lost everything on my laptop, and I asked Michael Rode, and I was like, hey, Michael, do you have the game? He's like, oh, no, I don't have anything. And I was like, oh, no. I lose my games like crazy. Yeah. Too. I'm, I'm horrible. All my old games, I mean, I only rely on other people to send them. Yeah. I rely, on I rely on chess base or other people. And unfortunately, right. that, one, that one was lost. So well, I feel, yeah, it's a bummer because because I can't create it. I was thinking, how can I create a position where queen a1 to, right. to a8 to h8 to h1 would all be best moves? And I'm like, right. no, I'm stumped. I, I don't know how to do that. So we're going to yeah, need to... I, I would say like 60% uh, uh, of my games are lost. I've yeah. just been super careless yeah. with score sheets. And I my computer crashed in yeah. 2004 and I didn't back it up. Yeah. I'm like an idiot, you know, just stuff like that. Like... Yeah, I know. That's so frustrating. But uh, taking things back into your own chess childhood or whatever, what captivated you most about chess when you started? Um, I w it was like love at first sight. It was instantaneous love. I don't know why I loved it. I just did. It was, uh, I, and, I, and I was uh, extraordinarily ungifted. Mm. Okay, I was, I was like the, you know, the last guy on earth you'd think that would become a professional chess player. Hmm. I, like, I was a B player. I was 1795 still at age 17. Yeah. And, but I I goofed around. I, I studied, but, but in a goofy way. Hmm. And everything randomly. Yeah. And uh, when, did, when did it all start to click? <clears throat> um, well, when I was 17, I kind of decided, hey, I want to be a master. Um. And so I seriously began studying. Mm. And uh, from books or from books, yeah. What what, what was and, what uh, would you say was the the most helpful book you studied for your improvement? Um, the, the, the most important book of my life was Reassess Your Chess uh, by hmm. Jeremy Silman. Okay, because and and uh, Battle of Chess Ideas by Sadie. Oh, okay. Uh, Tony Sadie, uh, who I I emailed virtually every day oh. you have to if you're on tony's list uh, <laughs> you get flooded with 50 emails per day yeah yeah but um when i was 17 i read battle of chess ideas and i like i got this i was so inspired by the book that i went hey i'm going to be a professional chess player yes i'm 17 yes i'm 1795 yeah What's the problem no, mm -hmm. no problem at all right mm -hmm. so, Incredibly stupid decision, okay. 
Uh, so that got me heavily into chess, you know, deeply into chess. Yeah. Instead of just fooling around. Mm-hmm. Uh, then um, in 19... Uh, it was 1994. Um, <clears throat> I had been stuck at 2,500 for I would say uh, five, six years, mm-hmm. okay, maybe longer. You know, like uh, just like I was just trapped. And I thought, okay, I've reached my peak. I'm never going to get better. I read Reassess Your Chess, and within like uh, you know uh, five months. Uh, I mean, maybe a year. You know, because we didn't play as much, but it was like, just suddenly I went to 2600. It was like, mm. what? And it was just from reading Reassess Your Chest, which is supposed to be a beginner's book. Yeah, it's funny. I read it only for my students. I, I mm. read it as a teaching tool, mm. but something in the book clicked, and mm. uh, I, I don't know what, Wow. but suddenly got 100 points stronger after six years, you know, like wow. of, of getting stuck at 2500. Wow. So I don't know why... Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've 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 heard of I've heard of people who get stuck at a certain rating, and then some. I, I want to say that some book or something they do just really inspires them, and it just really makes them work hard, think, rethink things, just focus on things in a different way. And it doesn't matter so much whether it's that uh, groundbreaking or astounding, but if it really gets them, like, moves them as a person somehow. So I've always improved in giant leaps. Oh. Though I mean, I mean, my goal now, of course, is don't get lousier. Don't get lousier mm-hmm. is my goal at this age. But uh, you know, like I was stuck. It was just infuriating. I was like this super high expert. Okay, mm. I was like you know, uh, twenty one fifty eight, twenty one ninety four, twenty one ninety seven, twenty one ninety nine. Oh goddamn it! You mm. know, like, I can't go over twenty two hundred. And then like, oh my God, uh, 2201. And then like next year I was 2400. Yeah. I went from 2200 in one year to 2400. Did you notice anything re- any, anything really different during that time? Did you did you become way more solid or did you cement your openings? My or? style hasn't changed since I was eight years old. Essentially mm. my style is the same. I mean, you can't be more solid than me. I mean, okay. if... if if I got any more solid, you need to add an extra rank so I could retreat one yeah. rank further, like negative first rank. Uh-huh, you know? uh-huh. um, no, I I don't know. I don't know what it is. I think my power of uh, just uh, I don't really, as, as I mentioned to you before the interview, I, I'm autistic and I don't really calculate it. It um, you don't calculate, you calculate long lines but, or. I calculate incredibly long lines, but what happens is um, they come to me like in a flash. Like they, hmm. it's not like I go rookie four, queen e seven, rookie five. You know, like it. I don't calculate like that. It's just like boom. You know, it's like it comes in a in a shot, and I see sixteen, eighteen ply like in in one hmm. second. But it, it, I don't think I don't I can't really call it calculation. It's more that it just pops into my head. Huh. And I see the line instantly, like mm. to the end. It, mm. It's part of the autism. I don't know how it works. You know, like I mean, I, I, I don't really calculate a single move in a chess game. Like huh. I mean, I, I just look at the position and I know what's right. You know, mm. I, ju- I just sort of know what's right. So, so but, are you uh, saying that your rapid playing strength is similar to your classical playing strength? Uh, when about twenty five years ago, uh, I, I was like. Uh, incredibly strong in blitz like like insanely higher than my rating my, my uscf rating was like 2600 mm-hmm. but i would take out like uh strong gms just like really easily like i was mm. uh, I, I i i played kasparov three games on icc i was one of the only two players to break even with him mm. and i had two blacks in fact but mm. I, I, I scored one and a half one and a half huh. um i um you know, I played like really, really strong players. Like first time I played Boris Agarup, um, he couldn't win a game against me. I mean, he was an IM then. It's, it's, yeah. I'm sure he'd kill me now. Mm. But uh, you know, we played for like an hour. He he could only draw and lose. Like I, he couldn't win a game. I just, 
Um, I would play Alt- uh, not Altunian, uh, Aronian when he oh. was a, a strong I am. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually didn't think he was very strong, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, boy, was I wrong about that. Yeah. Okay. I, not well, even judge chess talent. Yeah. Like, you know? Well, yeah, it's really hard to judge it because I, I remember. Well, there there was a guy who I don't know if you ever if you've heard of him before. Have you heard of uh, Simonian? Have I R. Simonian? Yes. Oh, yes. you know, the, the, he, he won the R. He tied for first. Incredibly strong in, in rapid. Incredibly yeah. strong in blitz. For, for yeah. a time, he was the top ICC blitz player. And right. he, he was playing even with, with Nakamura. And so he was here in Budapest in 2010 and 2011. And I would just hang out with him in the lobby at 2 or 3 in the morning in, in five-star hotels in Budapest. And he would just play, play blitz on ICC and, you know, chess.com. And... He would be the top player, and I would just sit there wa- watch him play for hours, just like captivated by his opening choices, which were very quirky, very very unusual. Did he, did he play a lot of B three? He did. Yes. He played like you know his He and he, stuff. he played B three before B three was a thing by Carlson. You right. know Carlson playing that close Sicilian with B three. Now right. now GMs are talking about like oh this might be a real try for White, but he was right. doing that like ten years ago. Right. And uh, he did he did a lot of interesting, unusual stuff in the closed Sicilian and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, he's he's a guy who like if you just looked at him in terms of pure talent, you'd be like, okay, that guy is going to be twenty six fifty. But I haven't heard of him. I haven't heard from him in a long time. Yeah, so I'm the same way. I mean, like I you know I, I was a I was like a like maybe a weak GM strength player and a very strong I am. In yeah. My, my past. But uh, like I could hang with world class players in blitz, and it just never translated. Mm. I think it was part to do with the autism, though, because uh, I get the instant answers in blitz, uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. and they don't have time to work out stuff. Yeah. But, they, but in slow chess, it's not the same. You see. It, mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. The other problem is uh, I never have been able to travel because of the autism. Because oh. I, I can't. Basically, uh, my wife drives me to LA tournaments. I can't go to. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm such a doofus that you know, I, I would probably take the wrong freeway and end up in Oregon or something. You know, so uh, like I need someone there. So it was and just so kind I of. I can't travel. I, I never have been able to travel to Europe. I, I could not ever uh, uh, go places unless my wife was there with me. So it was, it was just kind of by chance that I just happened to run into you in Vegas then. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess. Well, I mean, I travel, I travel if my wife goes there, but I, I she goes to every tournament with me. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. like, like uh, it's like a 50-50 shot. If I go to a tournament on my own, yeah, in Vegas, it's a you know phone call. I'm I'm horribly lost. I like I'm in, uh, you know, I'm on the border of Arizona. Did I take a wrong turn? Yeah, <laughs> exactly, like, exactly. It's just hopeless for me. Like a, I like there's a gym. I go to the gym every day. And uh, it's like three miles from my house, and I've been going there for the last like you know twenty three years oh, or so, wow. right? But every once in a while, I just like I forget how to get there. Wow! Like I, I have to pull off the side of the road, and I forget how to get there. Hmm. So I mean, for some reason, I I never forget how to get to the chess club, which is further hmm. than the Saint Nicholas Chess Club. I've never had a problem there, but other places, I've been to like over and over and over. Like you know, suddenly like I just go uh you know, crap, I, I hmm. don't know how to get there. I, what I have to do is I have to pull over on the side of the road. I have to calm down and just sort of meditate. Yeah. And then I remember. It, 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 the, the anxiety makes it worse. You know? uh, it makes it worse, and I can't remember how to get there. And did you, know? you did you have anxiety when you played chess at all? or? Uh, terrible, terrible anxiety. Mm. Uh, part of autism is fear. Uh, mm. You're fearful for birth. It's like you're... You're terrified of everything because you're you're terrified of anything new. Mm. Okay, uh, any uh, you know, like when you uh, when you emailed me last night and said, uh, you know, I you probably emailed me way before. I just checked the email like yesterday, <laughs> and uh, you said, hey, can I interview you? Uh, like, oh my God, you know, like wave of fear. Something new, no, no, you know. And then I calmed down. I went, okay, I've done this a million times. Yeah. Well, well, I guess you also probably didn't remember that we had spoken before, so it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. It wouldn't have mattered. Uh-huh. It's something new. Anything uh-huh. new uh-huh. Uh, scares the crap out of anyone autistic. It's, mm. it's uh, like I just, I, 
I, I, I fight it, you know, and I try to do new things, but mm. everything new is, is terrifying. Huh. Well, fortunately, I'm, I'm extremely laid back about pretty much everything, so, you know. But see, that's the best chess personality to have, because anxiety means you can't sleep well. I had a big problem sleeping mm. before tournaments, because I, oh, I yeah. have all this anxiety, performance anxiety for the next day. I, I would you know? for league games, so, yeah. Yeah, I would have yeah, that. Yeah, and so... Uh, it really hurts. I wish I had a. It, I I have a laid back personality, but it's this this uh, ailment I have, which like just keeps intruding on my life. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, chess is a very tense game. I mean, you play complex positions. The clock is. I mean, it it seems in a way to sort of contradict a little bit of what you're saying here about. I actually lose all anxiety once I start playing. Hmm. I completely. Uh, I completely am, am free of anxiety when I play. It's, it's before mm. the game, the night before, the morning of. I, mm. I, I play in this um, rinky-dink Gambito game 45 tournament. My, my back doesn't allow me anymore to play in long tournaments. Yeah, so I right. Back. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's just a Saturday tournament. I, I'm so busy now with my writing and teaching that I can only play once every two weeks now. Uh. And... Um, there, there's one I am, like a very strong I am named Dionisio Aldama, the poacher, you know, who right, comes up from, right. comes up from Tijuana and uh, you know poaches my territory. Yeah. Uh, but it's all, you know, like I'm like a million years past my prime. I have nothing to prove. Mm. I still get like, incredibly nervous on the morning of every Gambito. Like, why? Like, yeah. What possible difference would it make if you went 04? Like, who cares if you yeah. bombed in that tournament or won it? Like, I. How does it possibly change your life? But I still have hmm. the performance anxiety, you know? Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. I, I, I would say I'm a lot the same. That, that yeah, like the night before, I might have some trouble sleeping before a game. Or I might right. have some trouble... I, I might have some trouble just getting... Just calming down and going to sleep before right. the game. But if right. I can get to sleep and I can wake up like two hours before the round, just right. have something to eat and then just go to the playing hall, then it can be okay. Right. And I'll be nervous for like 15 minutes in the playing hall, and then you play, and then it's all fine. Yeah. But, I, I mean, I was talking about this with, I mean, John Bartholomew and some other people. We were talking about how I, w I used to be nervous when I played GMs at the beginning. And then I played maybe 15, and then it was kind of like, okay, it's all the same now. I went from being right. really nervous right. to just not nervous at all. Right. It was kind of like... Attitude. You've got the perfect... Um disposition for a chess player you you've got the absolutely perfect mind for a chess player your your personality i'm talking about you know mm. because it's a it's a complete waste of energy i mean think about it like who cares like, yeah. I mean, we're, like you know take a look at our a, a nasa picture of our of our galaxy yeah like, yeah yeah just, like you know one <laughs> tiny insignificant sun mm -hmm. out of three billion and one insignificant planet yeah like, Every human being, you know, every human being that's ever lived, who cares what right? mm -hmm. you did or didn't do? Yeah, just you know, relax. You're, yeah. You're tiny. You're tiny. Mm -hmm. If you look at it, I, if you, I, you know, I, I'm a heavy meditator, and I've been into Buddhism for like 50 years. And uh, Sorry, let me just I, close my yeah. window. Oh, we sometimes get these loud fire trucks and stuff, so <laughs> just wanted to close that. Okay, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've, I've been into the, like, uh, Buddhism for 50 years, and I'm just wondering why, you know, I'm calm in every other aspect of uh. my life. Only chess. Like, oh, I, I, I panic with two things. I panic with chess, and I panic whenever I get a new book. Oh, really? And it's like my, my wife, Nancy, tells me, like, you know, for God's sakes, you know, this is like you're working on your 43rd book, <laughs> and I'm going, I can't do it, it's too hard, I can't mm. do it. You know, what are you talking about? You can, you know, but until I see the skeleton of the book, like, as mm. I, I can't sleep well. When I get a new mm. book, it, it mm -hmm. sort of absorbs yeah. my whole life, and all I think about is the book, like, yeah. all the time. And uh, until I can, until the first two weeks are there, and I, I kind of see the skeleton. Then all of a sudden I see the whole book, you know, like I can, mm. I, kind of, I, I kind of can see how the whole book will be. And I told, and it's complete calmness from that point on. Mm. Like zero, 
anxiety, but for, for the first two weeks, freak out, complete freak out. Hmm. Until I can, until I have that uh, Cliff's Notes version of the book, yeah. freak out. Yeah, no, I, I'm very much the same way. It was kind of like with, with the first book I wrote, it was like at first things to be, seemed to be all over the place. And then when I had a clear structure on what I wanted to do, then it's like, oh, okay, now I just fill in the details, basically. It's like I know what I'm doing, so now I just go do it, basically. Yeah, well, you're a hell of a lot calmer than me. In my first book, it was like, ah, what, ah what, what was your first, what, I can't do it. You what know? was your first book? Uh, Play the London System. Oh, okay. What year was that? Uh, 2003 or 5? 7? I, no, I think it was 2008. Wow, maybe. 2008. I, I mean, I think it even came out like much later, but I started huh. writing it late 2008. Maybe 2009, I can't remember. Wait, why, did, why did this suddenly happen? I mean, like just, I mean, writing 40 books in 10 years. That's crazy. I mean, how, how did that happen and not like, I mean, like I'll give you an example. So I had basically written a book kind of way before having any publisher and I and actually I never published it I know I had something else that it was like un, kind of unrelated but you know ch chess thing of course and so anyway it was sort of like well I had just been writing for a long time I mean did you have some books that you had saved up or did you just suddenly no, no I just I was offered a book on the London system because I'm an expert on the London yeah you know, of course, because it's the most boring opening you could possibly play yeah. with, right? Yeah, control the position, so, yeah. Um, I said, sure, I'll do it, you know, and I huh. got the book, and... Uh, you liked the process of writing? Uh, I've always been a writer. You know, I was a syndicated right, columnist right. from very young. Uh, yeah, I was an obsessive writer since I was a kid. I wanted to be... My goal was actually be, to be a novelist. I wanted mm. to be a sci-fi novelist. Oh. And, uh, my major was creative writing and literature, uh -huh. but I've been writing since I was like eight years old. Uh, but uh, I actually did not think write, uh, Play the London System was fun. Oh. Uh, then I... Uh, How did you I get contacted about writing the book? Did they just say, oh, you're... John Watson told uh, John Ems, uh, uh, yeah. hey, yeah. You're, you know, he knew that John Ems was looking for someone to write a book on the... The, the London. London. John Watson lives like three blocks. Oh, from okay, me. okay. Uh, and so uh, his wife is a professor. Well, I live right next to San Diego State. And uh, his wife is not a professor at San Diego State. She's a professor at some other university. But my wife works at San Diego State. Right, you know, we, right. we live like a mile from the university. Mm -hmm, in fact, mm -hmm. look, look, right here, SDSU. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay, but, uh, yeah. You know, I, I didn't enjoy writing the chess book. But you see, I'm, I'm like uh, a natural uh, fiction writer, not mm. a not a, a non-fiction writer. And then I, I kind of decided, uh, they offered me another book, and from that point on, I kind of decided, um, you know, I, I want to write these chess books the way I want to write them. I, mm. I'm going to try, I'm going to write a chess book as if it's fiction. Uh, like, like, uh. As if it's like a story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, the the... So I started writing like that, and my books became like like really popular, and so yeah. the contracts just kept getting. Get, yeah. Here's another. Here's another. And, and were, with, were they almost all with the same companies, or? Well, I wrote my first twenty, uh, thirty books with uh, Everyman, yeah. and then New and Chuck. What happened was my books got queued up. Like I wrote so quickly. Yeah, yeah. That I had like four books all in edit and they begged me stop writing books okay <laughs> this instant we yeah you know like yeah, i don't want another book for six months mm -hmm. and I, I went oh my god if i can't write for six months what am i going to do and jeremy silman had come over to visit and uh i told him that like where does he live by the way he lives in los angeles oh. and japan he, he oh. spends half his time in mm -hmm. la Half his time in Japan. Oh, okay. And, and I think he wants to spend his hundred percent of his time in Japan, but they have some weird law mm. where you can only spend so many months mm -hmm, until you're mm -hmm. a citizen. It's a very hard to be a Japanese citizen. Yeah. But I think that he'll become one because he's training the Japanese uh, team. Oh, really? Huh. The chess team. Yeah. Yeah, J Japan because it's like a go country. Yeah. It's like really low in chess comparatively. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, uh, 
because of this thought, this weird style, it's very popular, but it's also completely hated by by about they're estimating about twenty percent absolutely hate my books. Mm-hmm. They're full. They're full of jokes. They're full of stories. Right. Right. Of, metaphors, uh, descriptive writing, right, you know, like, right. I mean, basically creative writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the chess to me is a nuisance in the book. <laughs> okay. It's a, it's a complete nuisance. Like I, I want to be an actual writer without the chess, but since, you know, this is what I have, yeah. I do the chess and then I, I write a lot in yeah. my books. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I have this situation where, uh, essentially, I have a I have super fans and super haters. Mm. I have these people. I, I have like these worshipful fans mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. Where they only buy my books. Nobody else really? books, just huh. yours. Like you're you're a living god. <laughs> and then I have the the uh, the other guys. You know, like you are the worst writer I have ever. But seen but before. don't they? But but don't the people who dislike your work? Don't they just get? get tired of it at some point. They're just like, all right, well, it's another Lock to Walla book, so I've already complained about the last two. So what I don't get. I get uh-huh. multiple bad reviews. Like, uh-huh. like you, you give me this horrible review because you hate my writing. Yeah. Can you buy another book? Yeah. <laughs> you see the verified purchaser. Right? It's like, what the hell? Dude, buy, buy Eric's book, please. <laughs> we'll give it a five star. Stop buying mine. Yeah, know? yeah, no, I, I, I would completely agree. Uh, I mean, also because, like, well, I, I mean, I, it's kind of like it depends on what your style is, what your personality is. My my philosophy when I wrote articles or books was just that I was never going to make any jokes, and I was just going to stick plainly to the chess. I wasn't going to attempt humor at all. I wasn't going to make anybody cringe or anything like that. Just stick like, totally. Yeah, that, that, that's how almost all chess books are written. They're yeah. Written in a scholarly way yeah and the pe- i understand why they hate my writing because they see um they are by the way this is the uh you are a member of the chess is my religion uh <laughs> group okay where you worship chess okay yeah I, yeah I, I, I was talking to you for a few minutes before the interview i i could tell this guy worships chess i don't worship chess. Uh, right? it's uh, one interesting thing in my life i i I like literature better. I I like the study of uh, Buddhism better. It's like mm-hmm. it's like about the fourth or fifth thing in my life. Okay. Yeah, I would say I would say I really love chess, and um, I, it's kind of like when I try to get away from it, I get pulled back in. So I, I, the, you are you are to you. It, it's in your DNA. You <laughs> are a chess player. You you were born to be one. It's in your DNA. It, it's not in my DNA. It's just one thing I like mm-hmm. in, in life. I love I love the beauty of the game. Mm. Uh, but I hate the competitiveness. I'm not mm. a competitive person at all. I, mm. I I get stressed out when I win a chess game. Wow. I don't like. I don't like beating the opponent. Wow. Um, for every game I do, I do these Buddhist prayers for my opponent. Wow. And I wish, I, I, I make prayers that he wins the game. Okay. Wow. This is not a good personality to yeah. have a chess player. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, okay, that is, I have no Kasparov, like uh-huh. I have no Alakin or Fisher. Yeah. I, mean, I, I have zero killer instinct. Wow. I have like, you know, oh, uh, you know, all the best of luck to you, yeah. opponent. I, may all your wishes be fulfilled. You know, worst possible personality yeah. for a chess player, right? Like, yeah. you, you should want to take the guy's head off, right? And I'm like, I there, I have one of those personalities where I like everyone, even turds. I love turds. I don't know why, but I there's, there's not a person I don't like. Like, people who review my books and say I'm the worst writer in the world and I make them, I like them. Yeah. You know, it's, no, uh, well, actually, th- there was a, like, I, I've been involved, I mean, I don't see these often, but occasionally there are different disputes I see between IMs or GMs or whatever, and I try to kind of act as the peacemaker and be like, okay, well, what does, what would you like to, how, how could we resolve this right. situation? Like, right. I'm, I'm exactly the same way on Facebook, too, mm. right? Like, uh, look on my feed, you know, my feed is a nightmare. 
And I'm one of those uh, ridiculous writers that actually puts in political posts. Yeah, yeah. Alienate half your writers. Right, right? readers, you're right, readers. I'll, I'll put yeah. in, you know, like something where, you know, Trump sucks. You yeah. Know, uh -huh. ah, you know, you get like uh, 5,000, like, you know, people telling me, I'm never buying your book again. I hate you. I hate you. Well, you know, what's, what's really oh, interesting... Smart, I would never make a political post, you know, but I do anyway, right? But I could put a, a picture of a, you know, I'll put, let, let's say I, book, I, I put a picture of, of I'm, a book of the Petrov is coming out. I just finished a book on the Petrov. It's coming out very shortly. Okay, for every man. Uh, if I put the book's picture up there, someone will say, um, I, you know, I love the Petrov, you know, I've always loved it. Uh, you, it, you know, you have a lesser chance of losing with it. And then the dragon player will say, you have fewer chances. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. With it. But what can you expect from an uneducated Petrov player? <laughs> and then the Petrov player goes that, yeah. oh, you're a warmonger. And it's like, a, holy crap. Well, you know. Posts on my yeah. Happen, you know, like, well, you know, there's, there's, I, I do get it. It is a very competitive game. There is. For, for some people, I mean, I've played games where it's like, you win this game, you get $2,000, and you lose it, you get nothing. I've played games in sure. Vegas like that. Sure. And, and I, I, so I get that side of it. So I have tried to do, well, what I've noticed is that I've tried to kind of do the opposite. I made no political posts for a, over a year before my book came out. Nothing that I thought would even be controversial besides silly, jo besides silly jokes. Um, and, and I haven't... Stop my fingers, though. Mm. I can't stop my fingers. I, I, no, no, don't, don't. Hit well, well also, don't hit share. also, I have, I have friends from so many different countries, and it's like, I, I don't want them to be fighting over me over something so unimportant. So it's like I'm also kind of trying to protect other people too from, from like. You're like the ideal chess player <laughs> and ideal chess writer. I mean, total opposite. You know, I mean, you're doing the smart thing, but I'm actually very respectful to them. I never attack them. Oh, okay. And I, I see, I'm from a conservative family. I'm a liberal from a conservative family, mm -hmm. and I do not dislike uh, conservatives at all. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I like them. You know, because I, I guess you can understand their mentality or something. I, 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 I disagree with their world worldview, but mm -hmm. I totally accept that they see the world this way because I would have to hate part of my family and I all right, don't, right. You know, it's like I'm from a conservative family mm -hmm. but uh, so but uh, I just like debate I like oh. watching the flow of <laughs> debate as a writer and so I actually like when people debate politely oh. I, I politely yeah it's the name calling which is yeah about 90 percent yeah you're stupid no you're stupid <clears throat> well you know what one thing that one thing i actually wrote in my book was i i said something like it would be great if we could avoid ibs intellectual belittlement syndrome you know where it's like we're just discussing ideas forget about the people right. we're just I, I say that constantly yeah I, I, that is exactly my philosophy exactly my philosophy yeah don't hate me because I think differently from yeah. you, and I will respect you. Exactly. You have a completely opposite opinion. I yep. mean, there are limits, though. There are limits, okay? Like, we're I, just, if you if you believe in murdering people, okay, I'm not, I don't mm -hmm. respect your opinion, but I, I have... <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, basically nonviolent. You're saying pretty much. Yeah, or you know, like I, you know, uh, if you support Nazis or white mm -hmm. supremacists or whatever, you know, like any any racist, you know, like, yeah. No, I, I no, I call you out on your bullshit. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I won't, I I won't support you there. But if you're if you you know if you're conservative, okay, like uh, we you know yesterday massive fight on uh, global climate change. Okay, mm -hmm. like it. And of course, the conservatives all say it's a it's a hoax, okay? And you know, we're pouring out here. Look mm. at this data. NASA says it. The Pentagon says it. Mm. Look at this data. God damn it! Look mm. at the data. You know, but they, you know, they have their opinion, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, but as long as it's respectful, <clears throat> it's fine. Well, you know, in in Hungary, for example, the and in most places I've been in Europe. It's been kind of nice to step away from a lot of the political debates and, right. and just like so, for example, by the way, everything that I hear about Hungary 
in any other place. I don't even really, I don't really even agree much with much, what any. Hear, what do you hear about Hungary? I well, everything I hear about Hungary uh, from the papers in the U.S. is something bad. It's always really? like something bad, something bad, something bad. Almost really? never anything good. Yeah, almost never anything good. They're like, Hungary does this. Hungary does this. Hungary is against the banks. It's like always some kind of thing. Well, really? I, I just, I've never read anything like that. Yeah, I, I, I just I notice it. Because Hungary is one of the best places to live if you're a chess player. Yeah, you know, we, it is. There are a lot of GMs here. I think there are 50 GMs living in Budapest. Some of them are, some of them are Romanian. Some of them are from other countries. But I, I've I've had situations. And yet you're overloaded with, with students. Yes, and you are. Your, your your great skill as a teacher. Yeah, you know? well, sort of, sort of. I would also say that that a lot of the GMs I would say don't want to teach. I mean, oh, or, or, or or let's put it this way: they don't want to have a sixty-hour work week like you or I would have, yeah. because it's basically like you can't play then if you do the sixty-hour exactly. thing. But, but that's the whole point. I don't yeah. want to play. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, so I, I, I've, I had a, I had a situation uh, like there was a, there was a GM who was about twenty six seventy five feet a who quit chess, and I, I spoke with him because my, I had a student, I, so I had the student who I mentioned, uh, he, he had his dad owned a hotel, and so Wang Yue and Li Chao were living there, and he wanted lessons with as many people as he could get lessons from in Hungary. And so he, right. he wanted me to contact the best, whether it was Leiko or anybody. I tried to sure. reach Leiko. Okay, Leiko was unreachable. But I tried to, I, so, I, so I contacted Zoltan Gimeshi, who, by the way, I think is a great guy. So keep in mind, I'm never, I, 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 as a philosophy, I never say anything bad about anybody. Because I, I just think, you know, actually one person criticized me. They said, you know, I think Kislik is just trying to get author karma. He says great things about everybody just because he wants them to give back to him. And it's well, like, I, you know how I read you. A, I think you're just naturally a nice guy and a friendly guy. I think you're. I, I could tell from your email that you were a friendly guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I probably knew you were a friendly guy in 2007. Yeah. Of, sure, I don't remember <laughs> that you're a friendly guy. Okay. So, but uh, a, you're you're a friendly guy, and I think you're a kind of person who never wants to offend. Ideally, and, um, ideally, yeah. If I was that person, I would immediately stop writing the way I do. Like, oh, I'm not right. afraid to offend people sure. because I, I, I will put my opinion out there, and it's it's on you if you like whether you get offended or say okay I disagree with you but I'm not offended. Yeah, that's on you, not me. Yeah, okay? that's true. That's like, true. They're, they're, like see the the breakdown of my books is. Um, probably 50% uh, like the books. Mm -hmm. They like my writing style. Okay. Didn't you say 80? Uh, no, 50% like the books. Oh, okay. 30% are ambivalent of my writing style. Okay. Okay. It, they don't care. Like, it doesn't bother them, but they don't particularly like the jokes or the the my writing stop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's a twenty percent where it's like I'm poking a red hot needle in their mind. Every page they read they, they go into a rage. Yeah. Right? And you know, it's like I um I thought about I, 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 I talked just in a podcast a couple of weeks ago, you know, like I I've tried to change my writing style. I, I can't do it. My fingers mm. won't let me. If I is if something pops into my head, I write it. Is, is there anything you've said in a book that you would just say, like, okay, now I won't say something like that again? Like, just from oh, bad yeah, feedback yeah, yeah. you got? I, I used to make political jokes in the books, and I, I stopped that. I yeah, I, 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 I remember reading something once where it was like, uh, I don't remember. You might have mentioned the Iraq War or something, and it was like that's it was like a one, huge that's one star for you, bastard. You know? But but you had a bunch of people who were like who were like I'm gonna give this a five star just because of this one was, star. Yeah, exact, that was Alakin's defense, move by move, and that totally that that was my uh, teachable moment. Yeah, right there. I went okay, no more political. <coughs> we'll post political stuff on Facebook. Facebook is, you know. That's my beliefs, my opinions. I can post my, my stuff there. 
But if you buy my book, you're not going to get my right. You're not going to get a, a, a political opinion. And, and by the way, it never occurred to me when I wrote that that I was writing uh, an anti-Bush joke. Oh, I, okay. It didn't even occur to me. Uh, it, it, I thought it was so obvious. It was an anti-war comment or something. It a, yeah, it was an anti-war comment. Like mm-hmm. I, I said something like. Uh, the Alkins defense is, is about overextending. Oh, right, 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 right. right. If you don't, if you don't like, believe me, I was going to put, um, just ask, I, I was going to put... You were going to say that the... the yeah, okay. I, Something I, historical. Alexander yeah, nobody would have, nobody would have batted an eye. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I was going to put, like, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, mm-hmm. Hitler, and Bush. And oops, I put Bush and Hitler next to each uh, other. Uh-huh. And the Bush people went nuts. Mm-hmm. And I... It really took me by surprise. I was uh, like, what the hell? Like, yeah. I, like, you know, but I, I learned my lesson there. I'm, I do not do political jokes in my books. Mm-hmm. I, I do if it's... Um, what year was that book from? 2012 or... Uh, was it later? About then. Because yeah, it was it, it wasn't yeah. recent. It was like five year, years ago or or more. Much more than five. It was probably yeah. It was like at least six. Maybe Cause, even yeah, because I remember it from a while ago. Yeah, that's yeah, that, that's yeah. interesting. But I do okay. I I learned my lesson there, and I it, I will post political stuff on Facebook. Mm. I, I try to stay off Twitter just because like uh, like I I read one of Trump's tweets and like I like I start throwing things at the TV. You know? oh, okay. So I stay off Twitter, okay? But, uh, I mean, I, I post, like, the minimum possible stuff on Twitter, but I, oh, okay. I, 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 uh, I'm heavily on Facebook, and I'm... Yeah, well, the, the, the chess... Uh, I don't really understand what's what the chess social media scene is like, because the way I've seen it been, it's kind of like I have one video with, I don't know, 13,000 views, a couple other videos with a couple thousand views. Uh-huh. Um I just, just it's just kind of scattered about. But whenever I I make some kind of instructive post about chess, let's say on Twitter or or Facebook, uh-huh. it gets almost no interaction at all. It's interesting. Well, you have to build up. You have to build up on uh, on Facebook. Like now, yeah. like uh, when I was first on there, you know, I'd post something and I'd get like you know. Uh, 10 people commenting yeah now if it's like especially if it's a chess thing i can get three four hundred yeah which for facebook is enormous yeah right? that's a lot of people yeah that, that's, that for, for twitter it's nothing but for yeah me, see i'm the opposite because i'm never on twitter yeah uh like i'll get like 35 people like you know, saw this thing like nobody yeah. follows me on twitter because i'm yeah. hardly ever on there but on facebook I have like nearly, I, I don't know what it is, but I, I think I'm approaching the 5,000. Oh, people. right, right. Then I, then I have to do the Joe Stalin thing and go on the purge. Right? Oh, I right. Have to purge the people and who did, I don't have much interaction did, with. Did you, did, did you have to censor anybody on any of your platforms you used? I have, I have a philosophy <clears throat> of no matter how obnoxious the person is you never... or how in my face the guy is, mm-hmm. I never block and I never unfriend. Oh. I have one exception. If they're abusive, if they start cursing me out, they will get blocked and they will get unfriended. Has that happened and, before? But, or? Okay, in all my years on Facebook, I don't know how long I've been on, <clears throat> probably, you know, 10 years or something. I, I have no idea how long I've been on Facebook. It, actually, probably less than 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe about 8, 7. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in all that time... Uh, I've only blocked two people. Yeah, this I, I think, I think I, I think I blocked two people. One of them was somebody who was repeatedly posting on my wall, and it was like flooding my wall. And it's like, right. you know, I don't, I, I didn't even want to block the guy, but it's like, uh... ah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, those guys, I'm tempted by the way. Mm-hmm. They're they're irritating, and they want to sell their stupid product. Oh, okay. And they're kind of like, it's like this. Sim- it's not a symbiosis but it's a one-way relationship right they use you yeah you know you, look the bird that lands on the crocodile's face yeah. and cleans the teeth the crocodile gets dental work the bird gets the algae okay the food okay <laughs> right you don't get you don't get jack when the guy posts hey everyone buy my <laughs> crappy book right you know? right <clears throat> yeah yeah well well i also i also had yeah i also had it where like i so and I made very, very minimal posts, but I just, you know, I made one post about my book and 
on the post of my book, someone was promoting somebody else's book, and I was like, yeah, that's that's irritating. That's it. by the way, I like uh, the one guy I just blocked I, about uh, a month ago. Uh, he like, uh, you know, okay, I I think I posted some book. It may have been Winning Ugly, in fact, or, mm. or it may have been another book for every man. It may have been my D four C four book, and the the guy the guy said. Uh, he got mad about some Trump post I made, and you know he called me an effing dick, and you know, mm-hmm. you're, you know, you're a dumbass, and like, and I said, uh, I didn't even block him there. Okay, I said, right. hey, this is about the chess. You know, I'll, I'll be oh. happy to discuss this with you on a political page. Right. But he just kept going, and so you know, I said, sorry, dude, you're you're blocked, you're uh, you know, like so. Yeah, if it gets too much, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've. I, I, in a couple of cases, I've unfriended people just just because of maybe incessant negativity. Um, you, you know, I, 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 it's like I, I really rarely use social media. I gotta say, okay. you, you would assume that I'm on it. By the way, you would sell a lot more books if you did. I probably sh- I, I probably should figure out a better way to do it because I know a guy. I don't know if you know about this. Well, Kevin Go. Do you know who Kevin Go is? I, I know him. Yes. I, 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 not personally, but I know of him. So, so, uh, so I helped him edit his his book uh, uh, from about six years ago. It was, so it was Bishop G Five uh, Developments in the in the Nidorf. Okay. And and you know it's kind of a niche subject, but it was it was a fun book. And actually, it was kind of bad luck. It came out at the same time as the Negi book. So two Bishop oh, G Five Nidorf yeah, books. Yeah. Like what are the odds? There, they, yeah. it, was, it was like in the last five years there were what like two books on Bishop G five, and they both came out the same week or something. Yeah, that's a, that's really unfortunate. That happens with me too. Usually, I'm the guy that buries the other guy. Though, oh. but, but but it does affect the sales for me sure. too because it, some people buy that. Th- book they're like, oh, I'm only gonna get one. I'm not gonna. Both sides are harmed. Both yeah, sides are harmed is what happens, and it's just random, right? Yeah, it's random. <laughs> Because you don't know what you don't coordinate with other publishers. And say, hey, don't yeah. put your, you know, stall on your perk book or your yeah. modern book because I'm putting out one. You know, I don't know what they're putting out, and so the, I just go with what my publisher wants. Well, right? so, so so what happened was with uh, so apparently um, Kevin Go did some some book reviews. He he reviewed an opening book and he did it on Chess.com and it got forty one thousand views. And oh the guy who the guy who wrote the book got like 200 sales in a day. I was like, "Geez, yeah, I, I I didn't even know that was possible." Right. And, uh, and oh, yeah, yeah, you should get on social media. Get on, you know, uh, I, because of my autism, I again don't. I never write a chess book review. I mean, unless yeah. someone asks me. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think if you get your books reviewed, it's mm-hmm. it helps. My books are like really under reviewed. Compared yeah. To how many I sell? Yeah, 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 yeah. Always yeah. under reviewed. Yeah, well, but I mean that's that that's kind of what Gambit told me. They're like, you know, uh, a lot of companies will will have fake reviewers or pay people for reviews. We don't do that. Yeah, I I, I know, I know, and I I I will never. One I, problem is I never ask. I mean, I I have asked, but. It's extremely rare that I ask someone to review a book. I yeah. Mean, if it's some horrible review and I need to counteract <laughs> it. But what drives me absolutely crazy is every week I get uh, 25 to 50 Facebook Messenger messages where if that could be a review of my book, it would be a five star. Yeah, review. exactly. Like, Dude, but 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 why don't why don't why don't you just wait wait wait, wait but but why don't you just reply to them and just say you know if you really enjoyed my book then consider reviewing it on Amazon or reviewing. I feel like a whore. No, why. just do it. I, I, just do it. Just I, just do it. I, I get embarrassed. I I I I'm tempted. I, I do it. Just say it in a very nice way. Say it in a very nice I way. Blue moon. I do it, but I I can't get myself. I just feel like a whore every time mm. I ask someone. I feel like a whore. Like, you know, hey, uh, you know, like, because it's not a, a legitimate review. I already know you're going to give me five stars. Sure, sure. But, but, but okay. It's not a legitimate review. You know what I mean? So, I well, no, I mean, it's, it's somebody who legitimate. Well, well, it's somebody who, I mean, I mean, but wouldn't you figure that, let's say, on your 15th book or whatever, you're probably getting 90% of the same people, aren't you? Or... That's the problem. 
people. No, no, but 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 if it's ninety percent of the same people, is, then yeah. The twenty percent, like way out of proportion, over review the books. Yeah. Like yeah. they they review in a far greater proportion than the fifty percent that like it or the thirty percent right. that are ambivalent, right? <laughs> and so it's like, oh crap, you know? So yeah. Yeah, it gets. It, but I I think reviews are, are honestly are. Are, are crap like I, I have a I, I study with this uh, Tibetan high lama okay mm -hmm. he lives in New York but he visits us once a year and uh, he told me bad reviews are wonderful for your Dharma mm. practice Buddhist practice hmm. he says they lower your ego mm. and they help you practice patience if you do uh, prayers for these people and you know do mm. uh, Buddhist practices meditation practices for these people that have harmed you, uh, you get enormous good karma. You purify <laughs> your negative karma. And uh, he told me, you're the one that's actually, you have harmed them. He said, it's your past negative karma. You've offended them. That drew, your oh. past negative karma of doing something similar drew them to you hmm. to harm you. And so it's you that's at fault when they write a bad review for you. And I'm like, oh, man, why didn't I pick another religion? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, it's, it's so much better being an atheist. Well, well you know, uh, well, so, so I, I mean, I, here's the thing. I, I'm, I'm really happy to, like, so I had somebody say something like, look, I like your chapter on evaluating positions, but I would have liked, you know, 10 more examples. So what I did was I just sent the guy 10 more examples. I was like, all right, here are 10 examples. I, I would have put them in the book, but uh, I have space limits with Gambit that are very strict, so I can't go past right. them. So it was like, in the first book, I had 83 examples. I have a new book coming out in a month, and that one will have... What's the name of the book? Uh, the, 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 book? the first book was Applying Logic in Chess. The second one is Chess Logic in Practice. Okay, so, I will, okay I'm pre-ordering your book. Okay, cool. I'm pre-ordering your book. What, uh, I, okay, I'll just look up your name. I, I'll never remember the name. Of the book. <laughs> so, a chess logic in what? In practice. In practice. You know, because because basically they, they were asking me, oh, do you, did you want to do chess strategy or chess practice in action? I was like, no, no, no. There's already a book called Chess Strategy in Action. Okay. So I didn't want to step on John Watson's toes or anything. It's you know, I don't I don't feel good about that with the same title almost. Uh, Dude, you are too nice. Okay, you are, you are too nice. Okay, like, I didn't care about that. No, I I was just like, oh, but it feels like the same as somebody else's. So you know, like, kind of one of the things that I did while I was writing my book is I was like, so I I for example, I was trying look, I would look up a diff, uh, a subject, and I would try to find everything that was written on that subject, and then just try to say nothing that they said, and just say only only what I could say that's uh, that is what I think is helpful, but also a bit different. And although if there were if there was something that I thought was really important or really useful, I, I would just mention it and just mention that they said it. But, you know, yeah, I, I so so basically, where was I going with this? This Oh, yeah. So so basically, the first book had 83 chess examples, but a lot of words, a lot of words. It was a lot of discussion. And, and so so like the one good thing I, I hate the nonverbal ones the one good thing the one good thing about the book from a, a sales perspective is that i made it so that literally 85 percent of the book could be read by someone who's 1100 or 1200 oh, wow. and and but 15 percent, i would say 10 to 15 percent was probably 2000 plus content okay. so, so it was I'm like definitely ordering this by the way there's no book that I won't buy because it's too easy for me. Yeah. Because I'm a teacher, and I yeah. always look for how to teach, yeah. right? I think yeah. I, in fact, in my books, I'm a teacher. Too. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, I like easy books. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, well my, my approach to, to easy material is if it's easy, then I can go through it really quickly, and I don't waste any time on it. Right. So And, and if, it, if it teaches it in a better way than I teach it, then great. Right. I can adopt these these philosophies or approaches. So the second book has a lot more chess in it. So, you know, uh, the people who wanted more chess in it will get that in the second one. So the next book, the second book has, I think, 240 examples in 250 pages, something like that. Okay, so, I will pre-order your book. I, you, look, you got one sale. You got <laughs> one sale. <laughs> yeah, well, well social media works you, you are <laughs> yeah well you know the thing is uh, the the thing is I, I i do have a lot of people who who email me they're like you know I, i'd like some help on improving in chess and and 
well, what are your recommendations? And the thing is, uh, unlike you, I'm not afraid to just say, hey, you know, well, I did write a book because on, on chess improvement and uh, you might want to check it out. The the Kindle that I will do, by the way, oh, okay. if they ask me for, you know, right. like, hey, I want to help with this because I've written a trillion books. I yeah. just point them to that book. Uh, you know? OK, I, because honestly, the social media is getting to be a burden. Like mm. I'm now on Facebook an hour and a half a day just answering. People wow. And just 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 answering people and it's getting to be burden and it, it's and uh i i won't answer the guy that just wants to be the buddy yeah wants to be your buddy i can't i i can't have five thousand buddies yeah unfortunately we just don't have time for that just... i know but if you if you if you have something specific i'll answer yeah yeah but if, you know how's it going you know what's the weather yeah. like in san diego okay yeah i'll, I'll say hi the first time but then yeah. I, I tell them look and they get offended. They say, why aren't you answering me? I'm, I, yeah. I tell them, look, I, I work a 60 plus hour yeah. a week. I, Same I with me. One week, 63, one week, 60. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I cannot answer every person that emails me or messengers me. I, I get too many. Yeah. It's, I, I, I cannot answer them. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, what happens to me? So, so, and it's zero disrespect to the person, but... There was a guy who emailed me literally 38 days ago, and I was meaning to reply to him. He, I didn't forget. I didn't forget, but I just didn't have time. I honestly didn't have time. So it's like, so, so it's like, okay, I, I, today, it's like I responded to the 20 people I have to respond to. I responded to the eight emails I needed to respond to. Now I'm getting to the other stuff, and I'm like, oh my god, how can I do all of this? And, Welcome to my life. Yeah. Eric. Welcome to my life. Well, it's like, I think, at least in my case, you don't, I didn't prepare for it because, like I said, in 2013, 2014, I was just helping some IMs and GMs and up and coming FM. So it was like four or five people, six people. And, you know, I was just helping them with openings, analyzing their games, giving them training positions. It was a lot of fun. And then suddenly you, you move into this bigger market and suddenly it's like 300 people who right. want to see everything you do. I mean, do you think George R. R. Martin? That, I, don't, I don't know if you know who he is. <laughs> yeah, of course I do. Like, yeah, what is that like? Well, uh, well, you know, like, does he answer all his? Things? Well, yeah, what? I, it's five thousand yeah. emails a day. Yeah, right? I don't understand how that works because I, at least the one good thing I can say about not putting out any YouTube content at all, just because I don't have any time to do it, is that I can reply back to the people. So you know, like, I, I'll often get like three messages a day or something, and I'll just. Reply, you know, and there'll be specific questions on the video, right. and so I'll say, oh yeah, you know, this is what I was intending or something like that. So at right. least I can reply back to that. And actually, the reason, well, one of the reasons I messaged you on on Skype was so that at least I could get a hold of you. And I've noticed that with other chess teachers, they prefer to be off of the big things like Facebook. You know, it's like if if I get them on like uh, Google Chat, they have like three people on there. Where, whereas if it's Facebook, there are 30 people messaging them all the time. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like it, though. I like the inter... I, I'm a writer. I'm, a, I, I'm not a trust writer. I'm a writer. But one question okay. relating yeah, to... I like the interaction. I yeah. like the discussion, the debate. I, sure. I actually love being on Facebook. Right, you right. Up an hour and a half yeah, you just don't day, have the time. You know, did uh, did you write chess know, articles? Did you, write, I mean, did you write chess articles in before 2008? Oh, yeah, 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 for lots of magazines. I, oh. I made a column for this magazine, the, the official Southern California magazine. Oh, okay. California has two states, by the way, the U.S. <laughs> Federation, because it's so colossally large. Yeah. Southern California is one state, Northern California is Well, another. you know I'm from Northern California, right? I did not know that. I'm from San Francisco, yeah. Okay, that uh, freaks me out. I was positive you were from the East Coast. You have like a... I, I would say like a Philadelphia, Boston accent, a Philadelphia accent. If, uh, by the way, I, I, we talked about this before. Uh, the, I did the Ben Johnson's Perpetual Podcast with uh -huh. him, uh, two hour inter inter podcast interview. Two hour interview, yeah, that's a marathon. And when you called me, when you, by the way, all interviews are, are giant liars. You told me, oh, this will only take an hour, <laughs> two hours. Okay. The, I, I did one with uh, Arun Kumar a video uh, oh, right. about two weeks ago. Also, like a, a, a YouTube video. He told me, oh, like, 
Only one hour. The, the only say only one hour. His, his took over three. three that is really three. crazy. Okay, like this will take well over two hours. I know. Uh, okay, well, well, let me defend myself. Let me defend myself in the in the accusation that I was. Uh, <laughs> falsely tricking you into this so so well, well so, so I, I I did a yeah I interviewed interviewed John Bartholomew and when I did that he was like I really have to go and so I was like really looking at the time I was like okay and so I was talking really quickly and like you know trying to make sure I got in 20 questions in, in 35 right. minutes and uh, I, I I was about to ask you like do you need to get going in like two minutes I or don't, something I don't because Basically, I have the morning. Uh, the morning, I use you keep that for writing. Oh, Jim, Jim, I, I get up and really early. Okay, I get up like at uh, five a.m. Oh, okay. And I meditate for an hour and a half. Oh, wow. And then I, I work on my books until uh, like right before ten, and then mm. I go to the gym. Mm, uh -huh. And uh, then I get home like around uh, eleven thirty or noon. Mm. And I eat lunch. Then I write more, and then I start. The teaching starts later. You know, but oh, right. I write all afternoon basically, and mm. then the teaching starts later usually. Uh, okay, so for me, the way it, the way that it is is that I'm mostly coaching people in the U.S. So when it's right. so so for me here, oftentimes I'll start teaching at like 2 p.m. my time. So uh -huh. you know that'll be 8 a.m. on the East Coast, and, and so I'll start at 2 p.m. and on the weekends I'll often go 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. I'll just do a straight nine-hour streak. Oh my God, you, that is impressive. I, <laughs> you know, by the way, I can't do that. There's no way I can do that. You just that. get too I, tired, or chess lessons exhaust me. But for some weird re reason, writing doesn't. I, hmm. I think because of the the autistic, my fingers write the book. Well, wh me. when I when I'm t I, I feel like when I'm writing, there's I have more of a feeling of perfectionism and, and when I'm teaching it's kind of like I can just throw out ideas it's more formal I'm the exact so opposite. Mm. I'm the exact opposite when I write it's it's like a stream of consciousness hmm. it's like, well, I, what I do is I have a system where I in the morning okay if I do one game a day okay I in the morning I do the technical aspects you know like the chess base oh. you know black is better white is better right, right, right. This, the analysis of the game yeah, okay yeah. Then when I come home, I write the prose. Oh, and, okay. Uh, basically, uh, the way I write the prose is... I, it's a very I'm, interesting uh, layout. Yeah. It, Was that something you learned over time? Is it different from when you first started writing? Uh, I've always done that. Like, I've huh. always written the first draft, like, technically, even when, hmm. it's, like, even when I'm writing fiction. I write the first draft, like, very technically. I just slap it out, like, basically the, the, the technical part. And I daydream the the part that turns it into color. Oh part wow! The reason I go to the gym is I, I do things where I daydream. I'm on the uh, Me too. Me too. I, I'm I, I'm daydreaming, taking notes. I I mean I have like a thing of notes like right in front of me. It's like I'm like okay. <laughs> okay, like for in the ten years that I've been, it's actually I think been eleven. But in the eleven years, I. Like, I'm on my 43rd book. I mean, several of them are not out yet. Yeah. They're not out. But I finished I finished 42, and I'm working on my 43rd. Wow, that's okay. amazing. Yeah. But, so, okay, the notes I've taken, you know those yellow pads? Yes, those yeah. Those yellow pads? Uh-huh. I'm, I'm on pad 83. Uh-huh. Like I filled 83 yellow pads in uh, the... <laughs> you know, the 11 years, yeah. and each pad has between, I would say between 650 and 700 notes. Wow. Okay, and what I do is when I go to the gym, I daydream, and that's when my game gets filled with the hmm. anecdotes, the, the humor, the the prose. Um, I, I have to daydream it. It doesn't, it doesn't work. If I sit at the computer, the jokes don't appear. The, yeah. the, the, the writing does not appear the, the 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 creative part must be daydreaming that's you know what I, I i that's the way it works that's the way it works for me to a certain extent so there were maybe like 30 or 40 certain statements that i made which were kind of like sort of inspirational comments that i put in at huh? certain parts of of my first book and i would just say that at, at certain times a day i just thought something i thought it sounded really good and so then I just, you know, put it into a phone app or wrote it down on a notepad. And so I had like 40 different things 
that just came to me, uh, just like you said, just you're hallucinating or daydreaming or whatever, and then you think of something and you go, oh, I like, I really like the sound of that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that into the book, and then it's like, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you some advice. Stop being formal in your books. Stop being for every chess writer that ever talks to me and asks for advice. Yeah. Uh, a, a GM, a British GM, just uh, talked to me about it. This is how stupid I am. This was two months ago. Can't remember his name. Okay. okay. British GM, the writer. Um, anyway. Um, like Nigel Davies. No. For advice. Pardon me. Was it Nigel Davies? No. No, no, I know Nigel from Facebook. Yeah, yeah. good friends on Facebook. By the way, he's like an arch conservative, and so, but, but we get along because he's like me. He respects everyone of any opinion. Yeah. He's not Nigel. No, no, oh, okay. I, I love Nigel. I, I think he's a, a, a wonderful human being. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, this was another one. Um, anyway, um, like, you know, he asked me for advice. He basically said, like. How do, how do I raise my book sales? Oh. And he was like, he's like you, really friendly guy, yeah. uh, had a really good sense of humor. Uh-huh. Um, I, I said, why aren't you writing your books like who you are? Yeah. Said, so write your books. <laughs> See, my system is when I write my books, I assume I'm not writing a formal chess book. I'm not the professor at the podium. Okay? Yeah. Like basically all all players of our level are professors without a university, okay? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're just, we're freelance professors yeah. of what we are, okay? Yeah. And I don't like being a professor in the book. I don't want to be your professor. I want to be your higher-rated friend in an analysis session. Mm. Well, you know what? I, I have some bad news for you. I gave a I gave a, a talk, like, about, it was about three months ago, uh, at the Hungarian University of Physical Sciences, and uh-huh. there was a, a guy there who wanted to do a bunch of studies with me, and mm-hmm. they just, you know, invited me out to give a talk to a few hundred people, and uh-huh. uh, I just went there and just uh, basically gave a speech. I, I prepared for ten minutes or something, and that's just fantastic. just that's talked. I, I just expl- I, I, I explained my book basically and explained some my thoughts about decision making in chess and stuff like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. What I'm saying is write from the heart. Don't write from the head, mm-hmm. okay? Write, be yourself, whoever you are. If you are a serious personality, yeah. be serious in your book. I'm not saying don't be serious. Sure, sure. You must, you must connect with the reader. Right. The reader must, like, know you. Now, yeah. either they will like you or dislike true, you. True, true. You see, when you're neutral, they don't, they're, they're ambivalent. They don't true. Like you. They don't dislike you. True, true. When you, when you put yourself out there, they're either going to like you or dislike you. Yeah. But but look, I, I could I could tell from one minute of talking to you that you are a very friendly guy. You you are a guy everyone wants to have the beer with. Okay. okay. Like everybody wants to have the beer with you. You're you're you, one of your strengths is your likability. Mm. Okay. So. Put your personality in the book, okay? Yep. Unless your publisher, like, you know, <laughs> doesn't like it. Like, you know, uh, my publisher... My, Loves it. Uh, my publishers were, like, when I first started doing it, were probably going, you know, like... What's going on? Well, WTF? Like, yeah. What is this guy doing? Is he, is he insane? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. But, but when the book sold, then it's like, hey, let's do more of it. Uh, so but what I'm saying is... Just be exactly who you are. You're in an analysis session. Like whatever, let's say your your FIDE rating is, uh, you know, 2,500, okay, 2,450, whatever. Um, you're in an analysis session with a 2,200, okay, or an 1,800 or a 1,600. Mm-hmm. And he's your friend and yeah. you're, you're explaining stuff. You're clearly the stronger player, okay, but you're explaining things to this person. Yeah. And if you if a joke pops up, you say the joke. Okay, mm-hmm. write that freaking joke down in the book. If it pops up, write it down. If you go off on a tangent during your conversation, write the freaking tangent down. Because a book is is part of life. Right. It's it's part of life. Right. Chess is not outside of somehow of life. It's not this. Uh, you know. You... It's not this academic thing. It's part of our lives. 
Okay. So treat it like that in your books. I guarantee you, if you do that, your book sales will go up. I will give you, send me the contract. I sign it. My promissory note, I will sign you the promissory note. Your book sales will go up. If you put Eric in your books, people will like Eric. People will buy more of Eric's books. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm very curious what your feedback will be when you read what I wrote. Because, you know, I would say a lot of the time I went on tangents describing things and describing situations. Like, the first book especially has a lot of long text passages. But, yeah, it's basically just the way that I think, you know, the way that I approach things. And I would say I would say I'm... That's all. Yeah, I would say I'm a very... I'm very analytical about kind of everything in chess. I like to try to break everything down as much as I possibly can. I like to make everything as clear as possible, but I don't want to add extra stuff that makes it confusing. So I just... my philosophy too. I'm actually, I'm the least analytical chess player you ever met because of my autism. Okay. I'm not analytical, but I'm one of those instant understanding guys, but I'm very good at breaking down a position verbally. Oh, okay. Well, see, I, 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 I mentioned, I say this to every interviewer, okay? The least important part of a chess book is the analysis, okay? The analysis is, is, is crap, basically, okay? Now, I mean, if it's a problem and there's one answer, it's not crap. True, but yeah. But your annotations, like the, the actual, you know, Komodo or whatever you use, mm-hmm. right? Komodo, whatever you use, that analysis is all crap, okay? Because in two years, the new engines come out and make your old analysis all wrong, okay? Like, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned this in the podcast. Like, uh, some guy gave me this, uh, it wasn't a terrible review. It was like three stars on, on Amazon uh, for my Four Nights book. And he said that he really liked the book, but the analysis is just awful, hmm. just awful. I wrote that book in 2011, okay? Mm-hmm. And he wrote that review like last year. Mm-hmm. So his computer is like a zillion times stronger. Sure. I, like uh, when I go through some of my old books, like I'm horrified. Well, my one thing I would say. computer is like 400 points stronger. Yeah. Than yeah, I, I would say that at least the only disagreement I have with what you said there is just that in 2010, 2011, 2012, yeah, you're absolutely right. Engines were much weaker. And you just, nowadays, a lot of things look so easy by comparison. So, yeah, I, I mean, I do think that, like, at least with uh, the book I put out, I did try to check it with Leela and with Stockfish and check it pretty deeply. No, 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 no. I'm not saying don't do that. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. saying keep the analysis. Oh, you're saying that for, for the critics to be cautious of that. Yeah. Or, to me, the most important parts of the book are the explanation, right. the prose to make it fun, right? Okay, and uh, the analysis is like way back. Well, one thing I would back. one thing I would say is that a lot of the time it's like there. So, for example, I had a chapter in my book called "Losing Consistency." So, where you, where you've played really logically, you've you've set up everything to carry out one plan. You've put in like three, four tempi to pursue the plan, and then right. you suddenly don't pursue it, and then what you right. do makes no sense at all, right. and the whole thing is totally illogical. And so it was basically uh-huh. like a section on illogical play, and oh, and so it, like it. from, from like it. Um, it was I think the eighth chapter or something. Anyway, or seventh chapter or something. But anyway, it was this chapter just just talking about totally illogical moves after you've totally prepared for it. But the thing is. The important part was just where the guy made, you know, did something totally illogical and didn't pursue his main plan. So what I did was I did have to fill in the analysis, you know. Yes. No, 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 no. I'm not saying. I'm, no, no, no. So, so I am agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying that. I, I'm saying that that even if you see a lot of analysis there, the main point was why did the guy make the illogical decision, exactly and right. how could he have of why this person got distracted yeah, from their plan. Many times more important with the analysis of he should have done this. So, so what I often see is, yeah, what I often see is that people will go, you know, mm-hmm. oh, well, you did a two-page analysis of this, and I'll go, you know, yeah, but the point, what, the, the big point here 
was that, you know, he got the core problem wrong. He got the core idea of the thing wrong. So, yeah, so it, as a reader, it could be confusing because you see all these lines or you see, you know, a page and a half of, of annotations and you go, oh, do I have to play out every single one of these or are all of these equally important? Let me tell you something. Um, only about 5% of your readers are actually playing out your analysis. Mm. You know that? Like, it's a, it's a tiny percentage, mm. and they're all the high-rated players. Mm. Okay? It, most people just go through the bold moves of the game, mm. read the pros, read the explanations, and don't go through the analysis. I mean, okay, if you're OCD, you go through every line of every sub line, you know. And I've made that mistake, too, in many books. I remember my Fisher book. I like, the thing I deeply regret was I way overanalyzed oh, the lines. Okay. With, you know, way too much computer. Yeah, b because basically you were trying to illustrate that something was a little bit better and you wanted to, like, so you kind of have to prove it a little bit. So you have to just, yeah, you know what I mean? You just, and it's this horrible... And it becomes too long. It drags you in. Yeah. Be because you, you want to stop the line. You want to stop the line, but you can't. But it won't let you because, it, because it, you have to show now why. It's still, be, be, well, so, sometimes the position's so forcing that you have to play a few more moves. Exactly. And so you're like, oh, you. Yeah, okay, those lines you have to play yeah. in the end. Okay. But basically let the reader figure it out. If they really want to, you know, they, they own computers. Yeah. You know, so let them put it on the Yeah. And, and, you know, it's kind of unsatisfying for, I guess, just for a really serious reader if they read something and then it says, you know, like I've never said anything like, like uh, I won't include the rest of the line. You can check, you know, figure it out yourself or something. But, but yeah, there are, I, I, I have gone through it and just been like, okay, I'll include some more, some more lines here. What, you know what I'll do? I'll put, okay, I can see that the analysis takes 30 moves to prove. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll put like uh, eight ply, four moves. Yeah. And I'll say, uh, the complications are in White's favor. Okay. Something like that. Let the reader work it out sure, if they want sure, to. You know, sure. If they want to. I mean, I, it is a little unsatisfying. It is a little unsatisfying. Oh, just a little bit. I don't Not like a... the jungle. I yeah. I like the jungle. You know, the jungle is worse. Be because because you, a lot of the time you didn't write the comment to get involved in a jungle. It just, it, the jungle exactly. came to you. You didn't come to the exactly. jungle. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> But it, that's one thing I've learned is, uh, and I keep forgetting this lesson. I keep forgetting. Every once in a while, I have too much analysis. And yeah. I'm going, what the hell? You know, like, and when I go through the edit, I'll, I'll start chopping. Yes, me too. No, no, exactly. So kind of like, so basically, I, I don't I don't really, I don't want to bore people with tons of lines. So I, I, don't, I don't want, I mean, just as a, per, just for me personally reading chess books, a kind of sweet spot, like if I'm studying a My Best Games thing, like, a, I don't know, like Bolligan's Best Games. I love that book, by the way. So if, if I was going through a book like that, like each game taking maybe five, six, seven pages, something like that. But when it becomes 12 or 13 pages and it takes three or four hours to play through a game, I, I, I have to go through the game in three or four different breaks. And then I just don't even remember what I studied anymore. I, I'm like... I never use a, Do you use a board when you read a chess book or not? Uh, sometimes I do. Sometimes I do. Yeah, I never use a board. I, and I can follow the analysis no matter how long it is. Oh, I wow. can't follow it. To the, you know, but, but if they give me too many parentheticals... Yeah, like, yeah, then you get confused. Uh, yeah. then, it, then it starts getting really tough. You know? But if you give me one long line, I can see it, especially if there's a diagram nearby. Sure, sure, sure. I can follow the whole line. I'm an I am, okay? Yeah. You're an I am, okay? We can do that. But the readers are not mostly I am or DMs, okay? True. They're, they're going to be 1800s. To, to, I don't know what you, what level you write for, but as you mentioned, it could be an 1100 sure. to, a, yeah. to a, a 2200, you know? The, so you have to write for your audience, not for yourself. Right, yes. It's because the problem is I forget, and I sometimes start writing for myself, or yeah. I do want the long line. Mm. The only title players like the long line. Yeah, I'm afraid they do. And, and, and you know, I... I doesn't want that freaking 40 move analysis. But now, it, it, I feel like as I as you get more experience and quote-unquote age in chess, you kind of like it more when it's more condensed, and there's not as much fluff or extra stuff. And sometimes I get a feeling of when an author just 
didn't need to put in all this extra analysis, but they did, but they wanted to get paid for their work. So they're like, I'm not going to cut that out. And so, I I mean, like I, I, I've opened up and I've opened up end games books before and seen like the first position is like a really, uh, don't take any offense to this really boring, like Rook and Bishop end game. Like I find a lot of those endings really dry and there's not that much theoretically to teach. And it's like, you have some, okay, you have some concrete end game with some crazy tactics. You can analyze it with a computer for hours, but for a practical player, maybe it's not that, that interesting. And it's like, I see 11 pages on a Rook, one Rook and Bishop versus Rook and Bishop ending. And I'm like, could it not have been three? Could it not have been two? Like, I just want to, you know, and so I, and those endings are disorienting, by the way. They make you There's tired. No yeah. There's no strategic markers. Yes. It's like Rook and Bishop versus Rook. Yeah. And it's like one variation looks just like another. Essentially, you're not teaching the reader a damn thing. Well, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the time it'll depend, like, we can queen one pawn by one tempo in a 30-move line. And it's like, that's, that's how do you teach that? Yeah, it's, it's right. like, okay, sure, I can get them to focus on that right. past pawn or, or pawn promotion, but I, I just so I, I don't even cover things like that. It's like it's outside of my pay grade. I just don't touch that. But for the most part, I think I'm pretty sure in the new book, I don't have anything that's any excerpts that are over four pages or something just because I don't want to bore people and I, I don't want to put an extra fluff. And I just want to be so someone like they come in and it goes like boom, 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 everything right there. We move on to the next thing. It's like I have I have a couple things I want to show. It was like. So, for example, like the topic of of attacking chess. So I wrote an article in Chess Life called How Practical Attacking Chess is Conducted. I made a video called The Fundamentals of Attacking Chess. And I and I have a chapter on focal points in my new book. That's literally all I have to say on the topic. And it was like just I put in, you know, that's like about 30 pages of stuff roughly. And beyond that, I'm probably not, not going to say much about it again. You know, so it's kind of like I try to put everything right out there and then go on to the next thing, you know. Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, by the way, you asked me, am I, uh, do I need to leave? I just, uh, I, I do need to remind you that, uh, not remind you, but tell you that I, I do that intermittent fasting. Oh, right. Where I, stop, I stop eating at 6 p.m. Right. And it's now 11 a.m., so I'm just warning you. Okay. My answers, my answers are getting <laughs> stupider and stupider as the interview goes on. <laughs> okay. Like, I, I might just like you, you know. I might give you some answer that makes no sense because I've got a lot of right now. Okay, no, I I know how you feel. Uh, I do intermittent fasting in my eternal, uh, in my eternal uh, quest to not be the world's fattest vegan. You know, so it's like, yeah, I told you I have a friend who's challenging you for that right now. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I'll... If you're a potato chips and coke vegan, it's not healthy. Okay. But yeah. I'm a, I'm actually a healthy vegan. I just have this, uh, I have some sort of metabolic dysfunction with, you know, I have to take this medication for mm. this thyroid medication, but it doesn't work. I'm vegan. I work out an hour and a half a day. And yeah. I'm still fat. Like, what the hell? I mean, I am 59. Most 50, yeah, I'm 58. Most 58 year olds are pretty fat, okay? In America, especially. Fair enough, yeah. But, uh, I'm like I should be real thin, you know. I don't overeat. I eat like mainly super healthy vegan diet. I work out an hour and a half a day. Like what? I I do intermittent fasting. Like what the hell? Well, you're doing your best, so yeah. the the best is all you can do. I, I wanted to tell you, I, I cut myself off just because I always go on tangents, and we both do. Um, so you're, I was you're, you're meeting the world champion of tangents here. So I was telling you about uh, I was telling you about. How so? My my student was here. His name was Hu Chiang. So he was here. He was an FM. He was trying to like chase a title, and I was just coaching him and and uh, help introducing him to players who could coach him. And so I contacted this twenty six fifty GM, and mm-hmm. and you know Zoltan Giameshi, who I think he quit chess, and I don't know if he's like a a, a lawyer or I, he's probably some, some kind of job like that. But anyway. Okay. Uh, so he quit chess. I never, heard, I haven't heard about him in years. He would be like number three on the Hungarian team, and the Hungarian you know, team's like, pretty good. So that's you know, amazing. yeah, that's yeah. amazing to put that much into it and still quit. And still quit, yeah, unbelievable. So I contacted him and I said, I said, hey, hey, Zoltan, um, my student is here and he would love to have a lesson with you. He goes, oh, sorry, I don't teach. And I said, okay, uh, one day, ten hours, eight hundred euros. 
And he goes, oh, by the way, I was coaching the Polgar sisters a few weeks ago. And oh, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a great coach, one of the most famous in Hungary. And he just like in two seconds, he went from like, oh, I don't coach to 800 euros in one day. Okay. And, and you know I cannot be tempted by money, by the way. I, I can't, I can't I either. Still, yeah. You know, I, I cannot be tempted by money because I have only finite hours. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I don't do this for the money. Okay? Yeah. My, my parents ran a very successful business, about 50 employees. Okay? Yeah. I, I was offered a six figure income in my twenties and I declined just wow. because I wanted to write and play chess. Wow. Okay. So I don't do chess and, and writing for the money. Yeah, I don't think anybody goes into chess for the money. I happen to be comfortable now. Sure, and I sure. Broke. But it took a long time. Yeah, it took a very it took a long, long time. time. We were barely making house payments. My, my wife was a secretary then. And wow. like, you know, it, we, I'm this freaking chess player in the 80s and 90s. And yeah. I was, you know, we're just barely making, uh, making ends meet. And then, yeah. Even through the 2000s, the early 2000s, and then you know, once the books came, okay, my income rose considerably. Mm -hmm. Then the then the fact that you're famous in chess, means yeah, that everybody wants chess lessons. With yeah, you. yeah, and you can raise your rates. You can, you know, and you basically, I, I could teach sixty hours a week. I yeah, never run out of people who yeah. want chess lessons. I I tell two people a week. I can't teach you. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm maxed out. You know. Mm -hmm. And I don't want, like I mentioned, I don't want to be obnoxious and yeah. raise my rates to some. I, I have, I have, I, I did have a student who was like, "Hey, I was paying this GM 140 bucks per hour," and I've also heard of like 100. I, uh, I think there was a guy, uh, Elshon. Do you know who he is? I, uh, yes, but more. I, I yeah. The Iranian GM. Yeah, I, he's a good friend of mine on. Uh, oh. on uh, Facebook. I hope I'm not speaking out of school, but I'd heard that he had like charged some like $180 rate or something and people were paying it. And it's like, what do you do if people are paying the rate? And it's like, you that's don't the thing. That's mm -hmm. the thing. You, you know, it's the what the market will bear thing. Mm -hmm. But see, the reason I don't charge, I don't charge a hundred and I charge 60 an hour. Yeah. And so like, uh, which is pretty reasonable. Okay. I, I think pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason I do it is I mainly like real life students who live yeah. in San Diego. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, and if I if I accept a student online, it's almost always because I knew that person from somewhere before, oh. or it's recommended by a good friend. Like if Silman tells me, please take this guy. Uh, uh, as a student okay, let, let, but it's, it, the answer is no to everybody. Really? So so let me ask you a hypothetical. Let's say let's say you get an email from a random guy. He says. He says, you know, Cyrus, I know you're you're really busy. Um, I loved your book, Chess for Hawks. I've pre-ordered your new book. Uh, I, I like your philosophy in, I don't know, name some book. Um, you know, would you be willing to do three hours with me and I'll pay $10 above your, your expected rate and I'll pay you in advance? I would take the guy without taking the extra $10. Oh, okay. I, would, I, would the, I, would, I would accept that person. It, Honestly, like you know how I go with students, I, I, I get a feel for them. Like, I, is it a is it a respect if, thing? Yeah, if I if I if I get if I if I like what I see in the email, yeah, I'll, I'll probably take the student. Uh, if I if I get a bad feeling, I'm like that uh, with people. Mm. I instantly get a good intuitive feeling. feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I oh, by the way, good. Good, Eric. Good. Okay. So I, I get that instant feeling, and I just stay away from people that I, I get this funny feeling. Mm. From some people, I just stay the hell away. Yeah, I, I got some. I, I mean, I, I guess it's probably was just me including the word logic in my books and talking about it a lot. But I had some people like contact me about the book and some guys were like i'm a phd in logic and I, I i had to like double take like is this guy just trolling me and i looked the guy up and i'm like oh he actually is and it was right. like is like i'm a phd in neuroscience i'm like no this guy's got no he's actually is and so like I, actually i would say i would say a huge number of my students are phds i've, I've got harvard professors yeah I've got, uh, by the way that's a big uh, draw for me. If you tell me you're a Harvard professor, I make room for you. I, I, love, I love talking to smart people. I love like after the lesson chatting with them. Or oh know, yeah, like, I, I if, if uh, I, I have one 
I have one that was a Harvard professor in history, and I have one that's getting his PhD mm. from Harvard history. But I, mm. I love talking to smart people. If, mm. you, if you're a professor, that's the immediate yes. Mm. I, I just am attracted to um, the analytical I, I, side I, of it. Not about chess too. I yeah. Think about life. I, yeah. I like talking to smart people about life. Yeah. Know? No. There's there, there's a guy who I teach. He's a PhD in neuroscience, and he's just. A ton of fun to talk to and it's kind of like he introduced me to some of his friends who are in the same field and i'm just like this is just a great door opening experience that's the thing i love learning and i yeah. love to see perspectives yes. of uh you know very intelligent people i i i'm, I'm very i'm attracted to intelligence me too you know? yeah so I, I'm, I, I would think most chess players I, I, I'm, I'm attracted to yeah i'm attracted to this kind of like approach to making sense of complex things and throwing questions at them that I think very few people I know would be able to give me a good answer to and they'll really think about it and grapple with it. Right. And all my best friends by the way are professors. Oh. Every best friend I have is like a professor of many different fields too. Wow. But they're all like even on Facebook all my favorite people are professors wow. or a lot, a lot of, yeah, I like a lot of title players too because we connect. Because of you know, we we're, we're um, professors in our own way. We, of course, yeah. we're professors. Of course, we are. It's not like don't don't make the quotation mark. <laughs> you are a legitimate professor. You could teach in a university. It, the, I, I think that twenty three hundred is a professor. Yeah. Honestly, mm -hmm. you're you're not a professor. You're a concert pianist. Mm. You're you're higher. Yeah. Okay. Like how many people become IMs and GMs? Like how many? You yeah, know, I, and yeah, what 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 age did you? Millions and millions. Well, what I, could get a PhD. At, at what age did? Work. At what age did you make IM? Oh, I was in an IM till forty two. That was another Ooh. crazy forty two thing. Uh, it never occurred to me. I didn't care really about titles. I thought titles were, were like who cares because I was I knew I was GM strength for mm. about an eight year period. Okay? You were mentioning like strong IM weak GM type. Yes, yes. And in Blitz, strong GM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I have a weird way of creating a dichotomy there. The way that I see it is like the, 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 really, the, the really strong GMs I start to feel are like 25, 80 plus feet A. Do you feel that way? Like where, where they're playing black and they can outplay you in really unusual ways that may, like if, if I play like a 25, 20 GM, Probably the expected result is a draw, mo almost against any twenty-five twenty. But above a certain point, if I play, if I play someone in the uh, not now, uh, okay. I'm, like you know, I'm a caricature of my old strength. Sure, but sure. In my prime, if it was a if it was a low twenty-five GM, they would lose uh, a lot, eight to two. Wow, you know, they would lose eight to two in a in a blitz match. I mean, you wow. know, and they would only draw games. They might win one. Wow, you know? but if it's a uh, you know, if the guy if the guy hit twenty six hundred, then it started getting tough. Yeah, the twenty. Then I could edge them out. Even then. In bl in blitz. In blitz. Yeah. And why why do you think it was that that I mean I guess you don't really have a great explanation for why you were so strong in blitz, but the the gap from it's classical play. It's an artistic savant ability. Yeah. I get instant answers. Ah. Uh, uh -huh, instant uh -huh. answers. I, I see like a variation where it just pops, you know, like it, mm. it doesn't, it's not like one move, then the next, it's just like, bam. It just variation. jumps in front of you. Well, what was, you mentioned that you had like some kind of uh, stories from your childhood of, of autism in school or things like that. Well, I had, I mean, my, my mother hid it from my family and my brother and sister found out that I was autistic two weeks ago. Wow. Because I, I basically came out in that podcast and announced it. I mean, why did you choose to do that? Uh, I just that it's not a big deal, or it it it's a it's a stigma. Mm. It's a sti it is a stigma, and when you tell people, there's a subtle change in how they perceive you. There hmm. is a subtle change. Now, some people they're they're very sympathetic, and others it's like, hmm. wow, you're autistic, you know, hmm. like it. But there there is a perceived change, and I my whole life. All I ever wanted to be is normal, okay? And, mm. I, and I realize I can't do it. I well, may, maybe chess is our way of being normal, you know? Uh, 
chess was just my escape because it's an isolated game and mm. artistic life isolation. I could study for hours in my room. And, and alone. have you ever met anybody? Have Have you ever met anybody who was who was like maybe on the spectrum, like about a, a let's say like a seven or something, who over time dropped down dramatically? That was, that's me. That's me. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm like a, I've got unbelievable autism radar. I can I can spot an autistic person in a nanosecond. Mm. I, I watch their eyes. If they, uh, you know, it took me it took me fifty years of meditation can, to look you in the eye. Okay? Can, can, can you spot Can you spot also by by their gait? You know, kind of like standing on their aren't they standing on their heels often or uh, or they, or, or sorry, walking on their tiptoes tiptoes. They use quirky things. Anything. Quirky. If they do, they have little quirky things they do. Uh, but, I mean, there's a big, there's a wide spectrum. Some people are barely autistic. Some people are. I'm. I was heavily autistic. Mm -hmm. and, I, and when I say was, am heavily autistic. Like, like I mentioned, I can't live alone. Okay? Oh, okay. There's no way I would know how to pay my bills. If you taught me, I forget. Okay. okay? Next day, I forget. If, if you tell me the simplest thing with any kind of technology, okay, you're. Like, and this is this was embarrassing. I loved announcing that I'm autistic, like because now when people say, "Hey, can you email me? <laughs> you know, can you do this simple computer thing?" And now I just say, "Sorry, I, I'm really sorry. I'm autistic. I know mm -hmm. it sounds ridiculously easy to you, but I cannot grasp it. My brain, there's something in my brain where I cannot grasp it. I cannot do what you're asking me to do." And before, I have to bullshit and pretend, uh, like, oh, um, um, yeah, yeah, something might be wrong with my computer here, let me see. What, you know, what, what was, I mean, did you have any any funny stories or unusual stories, yeah, like when you were 15 or, oh, yeah, or 18? Yeah. Or? Many, like, I, okay, like, when I was a kid, um, okay, first thing, uh, I tested three grades ahead uh, of, of my, uh, of my age. I, I skipped a so, grade myself. Yeah. Oh, did you? That horrible mistake. You could never get a date, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I told you, I told you at the beginning, I told you at the beginning, it's a curse to have a high IQ. It really is a curse. Like you're just screwed socially <laughs> as, as you, from youth on. Um, and, and you're hundred percent like more screwed if you're autistic mm -hmm. and high IQ. Mm -hmm. you know, and most, I, I would say probably, I, I'm thinking 99.5 title players have high IQs. You can't do it without it, right? It's hard, so, yeah. Okay, so I tested three grades ahead, so they skipped me two. And so here I am, you two know, grades, like, wow. I'm six years old in a class with eight-year-olds. I don't speak the language, and I'm autistic. And Where, where, just, where did you grow up? I grew up in Canada in Montreal. Oh. We moved oh. uh, from Mumbai. India. So what? What is your nationality? Pardon me. What is your nationality? Indian. Oh really? Oh. I'm Indian. Yeah. Okay. I don't look. I'm. That's the other thing. I, I'm always the odd guy in everything. I, I don't look Indian. I'm mm -hmm. six foot two. I, you know, martial arts. And yeah, I'm, yeah. When when I met you. Indian yeah. That. When I met you, I thought you'd be shorter than me, but I'm six one, and you were a little bit taller. So yeah. Well, we're probably pretty close because actually I'm six. One and three quarters because freaking gravity and age has shrunk me. <laughs> yeah, this was twelve years ago when we yeah. met. So how are you six two and now six one and three quarters? Like what? Like gravity? You know, screw you, gravity. Yeah. Anyway, Bad luck. Uh, so when I was in school, if the teacher would get mad at me, uh, and they got mad at me a lot because I didn't understand the language, mm -hmm. I didn't speak English, right? Yeah. I, just yeah. Ah. I, I quickly learned. I quickly learned, but it. For the first six months, it was like a nightmare, and the teachers would get very mad because, be, being autistic, I would not do homework. I would not hand in homework. I, mm. you know, uh, I, I would just basically do whatever the hell I pleased, you know. And, and teachers don't like students like that, especially back in the '60s, where you know they could hit you or mm. they could, you know, do whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. But what would happen is if the teacher yelled at me, I would just go into a trance. I, I would. I, I would be unable to see the teacher, hear the teacher, or feel the teacher if they shook you or something. Wow. And I mean, think about daydreaming. That. I mean, you what? mean, or pardon me? Daydreaming. You mean, or no? Autistic trance. I would oh. just go into myself. 
Huh. It would be like I would just somehow my brain would be would, would be traumatized by the yelling, mm. and I would just withdraw into myself, huh. and I could neither see, hear, or feel their touch. And think about that. I'm one up on Helen Keller. Okay, you punch Helen Keller in the stomach. She goes, "Hey, goddamn it, who did that?" You know, I'm one up on Helen Keller there. Sure. Uh, but, you know, she would. They would call my mother, and my mother would come, and uh, I would get beaten up all the time because mm. I was Indian. Now I was the big. I was often the biggest kid in the class, even though I was two years older. I was like this giant. Two years younger. Right. My father, yeah, I was two years younger, but I was always like about the biggest kid in the class wow. still. Huh. And my father was like a wannabe Olympic athlete. He was six two. My uncle six two, and uh. all like very muscular. Mm -hmm. Like my my father missed the Olympics by one spot. My uncle mm. made it. You know, both swimmers. Oh wow. And so you know, like I I, I was like naturally muscular even as a kid. Yeah. But, I, but you know, you get three eight year olds. You know attack you you get beaten up so finally around like age eight or nine uh, I, I finally had enough and i started there was no such thing as a martial arts uh, class in the 60s uh -huh, uh -huh. people think there were martial arts studios nobody knew about that <laughs> until kung fu that show yeah. with david Harding yeah 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 in the, seven, in the early 70s yeah see? so what i did was i i went to every library and i read every book on fighting like, uh, uh. every possible martial arts wrestling every technique and part of the autism the bizarre part is i don't need to do something to become good at it all i have to do is read it uh. okay like i could drive a car if i read a book on how to drive a car i could instantly go in the car mm. and drive mm -hmm. okay and amazingly the same thing happened with martial arts wow where um uh, I, I never practiced ever. I just went through the moves in my mind as hmm. I read the book. And I had an incredible memory, so I would never forget anything hmm. I read. And so uh, just one time after I studied martial arts, these three kids came up to me. I, I don't know how old I was. Maybe I was eight and they were ten. Hmm. But I, I, uh, I put, like, all three of them out for, like, a week. I mean, you know, like, black and blue face, hmm. uh, bruising... Uh, you know, bloody nose, uh, sprained arms, sprained elbow, uh, you know, bruised testicle, ouch, you know, kicks yeah. in the sternum. Ouch. I mean, you know, they, they were just like unrecognizable, right? And mm. I would, and uh, to, I wanted to, I wanted it out there that this guy is crazy. And so I would beat them to a freaking pulp, mm. okay? I mean, I would, I would not just like, okay. I won the fight. I, I would like make them be scared of me for life. Like where mm. those guys, even going through high school later, if they saw me in the hall, they would like they would not make eye contact. But they, mm. they were scared of me for life after that because they thought I was crazy. And at that time, they didn't like nobody kicked in a fight. They used their fists, yeah. right? Like someone kicks you in the testicles. Someone, yeah. Like, you know. They, you know, hits you like this in the trachea, like you know, you you you, you hit the guy up in the trachea. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what the hell is this guy? You know, they're they're just throwing blows. Wow. And I, you know, I would have all these moves. You know, okay, block blow. You know, um, actually wrong arm. Block blow. Immediately go down, hit the testicles, go up, hit the nose. You know, and I do that mm -hmm. in like less than a second, right? Mm -hmm. like block, hit, hit. You know, uh, and um. I, I didn't need it after a while because I uh, because everybody was scared to mess with me after mm -hmm. a while. Right? But uh, when I was 48, I I fought uh, just sparred, you know, friend. Yeah. I sparred with a third degree black belt who was uh, 32, and I won quite comfortably. Hmm. So I don't know what my level is or was. I mean, now maybe I, be, I get beaten up. I'm, I'm an old man now, so maybe now I my kicks are ridiculously slow and they laugh and move out of the way. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I reached a, a, a pretty high level. I'm estimating like maybe a fifth or sixth degree black belt without ever, ever practicing martial. Well, that's that's not true. My son did Shaolin Kung Fu for four years. So okay. I didn't spar with him. Yeah, yeah. So I did, I did practice there, but mm. I've never taken a class. And I would I would attend his classes and I would watch intently, but wow. uh, that's 
that's like one benefit of the autism. Huh. You know, so it it, it it does have benefits. Like yeah. as I mentioned, I can write a chess book in three months. A four hundred yeah. page plus four hundred and fifty pages I can do in three months, and it's not wow. hard. It just it's it, and so like, you just yeah. would you say you you write it mostly in the morning? You said no. Uh, the the technical part of the morning, the, uh, the prose and the creative part in the afternoon. So if you're writing these games, yeah. So so would you say it's like three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening for writing, or it's more, it's more, it's like because you were uh, saying forty hours a week. I was just yeah, trying to... yeah. Maybe it is about six hours a day, and I teach maybe three, but I but I work seven days a week. Yeah. Thing. Well, why don't you have one day off? I don't know. I because I, 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 I I've been a workaholic my whole life. My mom is a workaholic. My whole family is. It's just the way I've been. I too. I grew up with workaholics. My parents were workaholics. See, they were out of business. They would, were, they wouldn't come home till late at night. I, I, I raised my brother and sister. I would yeah. make dinner, and we were latchkey kids. And my parents ran a business, and so. They would leave at eight in the morning, and they would come home at about eight thirty at night. Yeah, that would sell them on the weekends, basically. Yeah. and so I had to raise them, and so I, I just kind of got that. My father, he, remember too, he was a wannabe Olympic athlete who almost made it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so basically, he he brainwashed me that the way to beat the opposition is just outworking them. Yeah, outwork the opposition. You cannot. They cannot handle the force if they're. If they're gifted, they're screwed because that means they're lazy. <laughs> if you're less gifted, that's your that's your advantage. Yeah, that means you have to outwork them now. Uh huh. And it always it's been like that my whole life with everything. But but see, my problem is I cannot work on anything that's I find uninteresting. Oh. If 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 I open a math book when I was a kid, my eyes would just glaze over. Mm. I I didn't care. I I I wasn't interested. I I just couldn't do it. Like anything I'm un uninterested, like even, like I say, technology, my eyes just glaze over if someone tells me how to do something and I can't remember. It's just, I cannot, I, I cannot, no matter how hard I try, the concentration will not come. Wow. And, and, I, and the memory just erases it the next day. Hmm. Wow. You know, the thing, the thing that I would say is uh, from, I remember when I was in college, I was taking a Russian class and I, I had a bunch of these different classes and and I remember I I was just doing some chess analysis while while I was in the class mm -hmm. and the teacher so I was able to concentrate but I just I, I just liked multitasking I like doing many things at once and and I, I I just like I would be a little bit bored if I was just focusing on the class but if I had that chess stimulation on the side then I'd be like okay I'd be listening to this and I'd be focusing on this and the teacher right. just was so mad she just came over took my laptop I was like hey you can't take that that's two thousand dollars get that back and and um, I, I don't I don't I think the teacher eventually did give it back I don't know what the legal ramifications are of stealing you something take the laptop that's called that. Yeah, I don't think you can do that. Yeah, I was from you during class, or you know, but you can't take a laptop. That's called you know. I'll be uh, my con my uh, attorney will be contacting yeah. shortly. You know, <laughs> you can't steal someone's laptop. But yeah, I got busted all the time for reading chess books on the sly. Like I, the trick, of course, is you put the math book here. The chess book is smaller. Uh, and you put it inside, but oh my god, the teachers. No, yeah, my, my trick was to, to have a, a Bill Cosby book cover uh, over the chess book. But nowadays, I think people would say, please read the chess book and not the Bill Cosby book. Right, so, right. you know, time, times have changed. It's, it's funny about the zeitgeist of things. <laughs> like, he's this father figure in the 80s. Yeah. Like, this beloved figure. And now it's like, oh, Bill Cosby. Uh, yeah, yeah. Nope. Oh. Chess books. No Bill Cosby now. Yeah. yeah. But it's funny. It's funny how that works. You know, like, I mean, even with Fisher, it's like that. Like when he went insane and like, uh, I, you know, and he started spouting the anti-Semitism. Mm. I remember like uh, I listened to his uh, interview. interview after 9-11 happened. And I just flew into a rage. Mm. I remember I flew into a rage when I heard it. You know, he was he was laughing and he was he was saying ah ha ha ha. Yeah. Jew, Jew York deserved it, and you know just 
I mean, but I just I just remember getting into a, a rage, uh, like listening to him. And this guy was my hero since childhood. Mm. And I remember the mixed feelings. It's like you know, it's like you you worship your god, but your your god gets busted for child porn, and mm. suddenly you see her. Well, you know, it a lot of. Uh, very differently, you know? Well, yeah, things change. I mean, like, so uh, uh, in 2014, 2013, 2014, I was friends with a guy on, on Facebook who was less famous than me. His name is Jordan Peterson. Now he has two million followers on everything. Oh and, and and so I, I would just, you know, people, my, my friend would tag me and posts with him and we would go back and forth and have discussions and it was just this psychology professor from canada nobody knew who he was his youtube channel had i don't know 2000 subscribers i was like hmm yeah i wonder if this is going to take off a little bit but um you know it just seemed like kind of like you know you mentioned you love professors it just seemed like a kind of normal professor and then suddenly he was just like you know touring everywhere around the u.s and wow. became this very famous figure and I was like, "Hey, wait a minute!" He must have written a book, though. He must have written some best-selling. He he, book, he, he wrote a best-selling New York Times book. Well, there you go. That's he, why. Yeah, That's New York why. Times bestseller. Yeah. I he, hate the New York Times bestseller <laughs> list, by the way, because guys like you and me, we could write the greatest chess book in the history. It of wouldn't the world. make it. I'm yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. You are barred for life from the New York Times bestseller <laughs> list. Because people are too dumb to understand what you're saying. You know? Yes, he, we are victims. We are victims <laughs> of the complexity of the game. That's why chess will never be popular. It takes years just to be a really bad club level player. You know, it's, it, it's tough. The bad club level player is a freaking god on the street. You know, he is. He's, he's the best in his town or a local yeah, area, area, university. Yeah. yeah. I, I was talking to a friend uh, yesterday on Facebook, and I was, uh, I was talking about Nancy and I walk at this mall every Sunday morning just for exercise. Before the mall opens, we just do take this spin. It's an outdoor mall. This is California, so everything's outdoor. Right. So and anyway, uh, not that I have to tell you, you're from California. I've been, I've been there before, before yeah. yeah, just for 20-something 20 20 years, years, yeah. yeah. Uh, Anyway, there's this oversized chess set there, and, and kids play and people play, and uh, I go berserk if someone, you know, the board is set up wrong, yeah. or, you know, like the white square is on the wrong side, you know, like, like, like they, they set up the, the board completely incorrectly, or uh, they miss a main one, mm. I go berserk, and Nancy, like, is like... Uh, no, 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 you're not going to go over there, you're not going to tell them that, you're not going to tell them that, and it drives me nuts. And I told the story of once I was playing in this norm tournament in San Francisco, I told you I went for my norms at age 40. That's yeah, how wow. I went for my norms. And I got my, I became an IM on my 47th birthday. Wow. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I was in San Francisco for one of the norm tournaments, and uh, I saw these guys playing chess, and they, they looked like they were 800 strength or something. And then I saw this maiden three for one guy, and he made this double question mark where instead of maiden guy in three, he now is dead lost, like hung something and is dead lost. And I said, uh, you missed the maiden three, and then I reeled off the vari variation. And the guy said, no, I didn't. <laughs> and I went, like, what? I just told you the line. <laughs> yeah, it's and forced. I just got irritated and walked off. And I yeah. told the story uh, to a friend of mine on Facebook, and he said, um, like, basically, the point of my story was, look how stupid and rude this guy is. And he, he, his response completely altered my universe. He said, no, 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 no. You were the one who were, was stupid and rude. <laughs> and I went, what? And he, he said, look, this is the way chess works. Um, basically, people who are rated players are like the wizards in Harry Potter. And the people that either don't play chess or play like, you know, in the park, or basically eight, 600 to 800 to 1,000 rated players, they are the muggles, and they live in a completely different world. And they don't actually want to learn chess. Some don't, okay? yeah. What, what they want to do is beat their opponent 600 rival. That's their goal in life. But they're too lazy to buy a book and read it or study it or mm. check anything out online or do any chess puzzles. They just think 
next time I'll play this amazing move. And, you know, I, I, I remember one of them telling me, you know, like, uh, you know, I have this system and it's unbeatable. I'm yeah. the Sicilian. I push my H pawn, H4, H5. And then I push my A pawn, A4, A5. It just confuses them. And it's a forced win against the Sicilian. And I, I, like all, what, what can you say? But yeah, yeah, okay, huh? yeah great, it's great, really yeah. Nice, really an idea. I'll try it. You know, like <laughs> you know, like there's nothing you could say to them, right? It's so ridiculously stupid that. But basically, he's right. It's the wizard and the muggle. And he said, you've got to understand as the wizard in the part. Anyone who's rated as a chess player is the wizard. Okay, mm. like I don't care if you're 1200 rated, you're still in the wizard category. Compared to those guys, you beat the crap out of them, okay? Mm. Um, and you've got to understand the muggle mentality. I don't want to learn. I just want to beat the crap out of Joe who, who beat me last week, okay? So anyway, uh, it, it completely altered my perspective. And now on, on Sunday when we go there, I will not correct the board being set up wrong. I will not point out the maiden one that they missed I'll you know I, I'll just listen quietly and respectfully but I will have a grimace on my face I know that but I but I will no words will come out of my mouth yeah know? well I I have encountered some players who want to get better or whatever in those types of settings but yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the time it's just like I'm playing this guy he's my arch nemesis and I have to beat him or right. sometimes right. sometimes you'll walk over and people will be actually playing for money and you're like, you right. just you just interrupted them battling over ten bucks, right. so you know you just. The funny thing is, like you could like, you could make twenty thousand dollars a day if they would just agree to play you for a hundred dollars of blitz game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if only if only they would. I want to ask you a few more questions about chess. Sure, no um, what what was your best scalp of a let's say GM um, classical it, game it, tournament? I, I don't consider like the the rating. I consider the importance mm. of the tournament. Like that, I think that matters more than who you be. Yeah. My best scalp was a, a Cobian. Okay, oh, okay. Where he was leading the state championship by the by half point. Okay. Oh, okay. And uh, I think he was still an IM. He was a G, I think he had like several GM norms, and he became a GM maybe six months later. Okay. He was pretty strong. Okay. He was not a weak player. So. Um, it was the final round of the of the um, state championship, and I had to beat him. He was a half point ahead. Uh huh. And uh, I I played a collie on him. Like you know, I, I decided look, it's a must win situation, <laughs> but I'm going to be who I am. I'm not going to play a Nador and lose in 15 yeah. moves, okay? Or you know, play a winner, the white side of a winner, or get crushed against this. Uh, or he plays classical, but you know, play some mainline classical where he tears me apart because he knows the theory a hundred times deeper mm. uh, and I beat him in a pretty nice game with what I would consider a double X clam move do you do you have the game uh, I do yeah it's oh. in several of my books it's oh. in um, clinch it and it's in my collie book but I can email it to you, if you okay know. yeah yeah definitely yeah, what what would be uh, uh, email me our game I have no memory of I, I don't have the game I don't have the game it was, oh, a, it was a it was a rapid game so I don't ha I don't have it Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, but but that was an important one. Another one was um, I I was playing. I was like in the the height of my strength. Okay, it was like 1998. My rating was like 2598, and I was the top ranked in the state championship. There were uh, several IMs playing, and uh, I started the tournament disastrously. Okay, the night before. Uh, the tournament, okay? Uh, Nancy had a bad dream. She was having a nightmare and she was flailing around, okay? And so I go, Nancy, Nancy, and I'm waking her up, okay? Then, okay, Nancy's five foot ten German, like, mm -hmm. built like a freaking bodybuilder. We were bodybuilders in, fact, in our 20s, okay? Like, I last thing I see before I regain consciousness, her freaking German elbow, like, going up like this, like, no! <laughs> Yeah. So I had this horrible black eye, okay? I'm like, you know, I have, you have trouble sleeping anyway before yeah. turning. Yeah. And so I had this black eye from her German, you know, 
super powerful German elbow. Okay, mm-hmm. I was like in a daze. Like, what, what, what just happened? Okay, I can't sleep like most of the rest of the night. Okay, and I play the weakest player in the tournament. He's like rated like twenty three, twenty five. Okay, mm-hmm. um, I think I got my queen trapped on like move twelve. Oh. So I lost like a 12 move game or maybe maybe move 15. Basically, I got my queen trapped on move 12 and I went, oh my God. And I'm exhausted. I can't see straight. And then I play another weaker player in the tournament. He's about 23.50. And I, I beat him in this like, you know, eight hour game. Like it was the longest possible game you could play. So I'm completely exhausted, okay? I don't sleep well like the second night, okay, and I'm beating this uh, 2450 player, and he has to make, uh, like, he's this time time trouble addict, and he has to make, like, about 19 moves in 30 seconds, and I've got a winning position and 45 minutes on my clock, okay, and I hang a full rook, he makes time control, I lose that. So I started the tournament with one out of three, and I'm the highest rated guy, okay? Yeah. And those were the three lowest rated players I could play. Okay, next I have Jack Peters, who at that time was around 2,600, okay? Mm. You know, like GM strength I am, and I'm going, oh my God. So I I, I won my next four games, basically. Uh. against all the strongest players. I. I beat Peters. I, I downed this. Uh, I, I went to Starbucks. I got this venti coffee. You know, I, I, I put the legal limit of, like, ex- espresso shots in it, and I, I drank it, and I said, please, Buddha, get me through this game without doing something stupid. Just let me draw. You know, so I, I miraculously, I beat him, okay? Mm. And then next weekend, bam, 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 I, I won all three, and I mm. tied first and won on tie breaks because I beat all the high guys, right? Mm. But in the final round, I beat the I am Levon Altunian. And uh, what I did was, there was one variation. This is how crazy I was. There was one variation where it's a draw, and there's another variation where I lose, but he has to find the right move. Oh, otherwise you win, right? Otherwise, I win. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I actually picked that one. Yeah. Seeing that I lost. Yes. I didn't want second place. I said this run must continue. That was the biggest scalp of my life. Yeah. Like, crazy chance I yep. took. Okay, in that game, and I drove his king to his king got dr- driven to f five and he got mated. Okay. Mm-hmm. I I was more proud of that four game winning streak yeah. than any other. GM I've ever so, seen. So that. there's and a trick. Uh. because it was in the final round, because it was a must win, he's the strongest player in the tournament. I knew this guy would be like a, like a major gun, you know? Like, uh. I knew he would be unbelievably strong. And I, like, I, there was no, he tried to offer a repetition. No, no, sorry, no repetition. Mm-hmm. And I, I played like, like one of the best games of my life in that game. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, I mean, kind of what you said about that, it, it especially taking the risk where, where it's you either win or you lose. I, I have a chapter in my new book which sounds similar to some of the stuff in your play, uh, Winning Ugly um, mm-hmm. book. Basically, I have a chapter called "When Playing a Bad Move Wins a Good Game," you know, like a, th- yeah. that exact type of situation. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and you know, it's like it's one of those things where, sure, if you check it with a computer, you can say to yourself, "Okay, it's a bad move." But I literally won this game with black against the GM to get out of a really bad slump and to right. pull myself like this. I went on a really good streak to make I am, and now it's, that's where it was. It was like I was twenty three oh nine. I was really struggling to move my way up. Won a won a key game with black and then shot right up to twenty four thirty. So it was it, it was like you know when you have that when you have that situation. I would say I, I was also fortunate that all of my norm games uh, to to make I am norms were kind of epic games. I won two two pretty nice games and then I won a game with black that was one hundred and twenty moves and I tricked a guy in a closed position. Which was technically blocked, but I sacked the piece, opened it up, and managed to win in 120 moves to get my last norm. So <laughs> that's your best. That's your biggest scalp. Yeah. By the way, I forgot a norm tournament. Uh, I had I had the flu. For I, I was doing really well on the first weekend. Then I got the flu, and it's like, oh my god, no, you know. And so the second weekend, I had to play. Um, okay, here was my plot. Okay. 
I had a twenty four fifty in the morning with White. Then I had Danny Wrench. Uh, mm. You know the I am who runs uh, yep. Chess dot com. Okay, I had him as White. I had two Whites, then two Blacks. Okay, uh, and I had a raging flu. So here was my plot. Okay, I I drink massive amounts of caffeine mm-hmm. on the first day, uh, like to the point where I I would be a uh, an 800 player on the second day, okay? Yeah. I have both whites, and my head was reeling. I had a fever. I couldn't see straight. Somehow I managed to beat the 2400, and, uh, you know, I'm just completely clueless in, in Danny's game, but he gets into time pressure, and as I mentioned, my my strength rockets like 300 points in any blitz situation. Yeah. Right? And, you know, bam, combination, combination, combination. You know, I beat Danny Wrench. Mm. And the last day, I had, I had Black against two 2350s, who would both easily have beaten me, by the way. Mm-hmm. Oh, easily have beaten me. But I play six moves, I offer a draw. Second guy, I play six moves, offer a draw. My my norm, you know? <laughs> like, But but the, the games against uh, the 2450 and Danny Wrench, those were also included in Biggest Scalps because it was so important for the for getting the norm, and I was horribly sick. Like, I was like, mm. you know, just, I couldn't see straight. I had a fever. I could you know, like, it, I, I was like hundreds of points weaker than my actual strength. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's it's kind of like, it's it's almost like not your biggest scalp. It's just kind of situational. It's not. It's yeah. not. It's the importance, the importance of, the of the game. Importance of the game, yeah. Capablanca had a plus score against Alakin. That would have really helped if that, if that plus score was during their match. Right, right? during the world championship. You know, I mean, that would have yeah. been a really good time. That would have been a good time to use that score, yeah. yeah. So Alec and won when it, when it was the time to win. Yeah. It's not, it's not who you beat, it's when you win. Yeah. Is, is, is the, is the yeah, exactly. I mean, I, like I won a game. I, I, I got to say, I won a game against a guy who was rated 2680 FIDE in a FIDE rated game, but it was a rapid game. And it's like I won the game, and I was just like, mm, meh. You know, it's like, it's like had it been, had this been a game for money for, like, first prize in the tournament, yeah, and I won it, I would have been, like, screaming from the rooftops or something. I'd be pretty happy. If I beat a 2680 feet, I wouldn't have done eh. Oh, baby. <laughs> I, I, you know, but you don't want, I mean, like the next round starts in 10 minutes and stuff. You know what I mean? So it was like. Oh, it, that's an amazing accomplishment. I mean, yeah, it was. not supposed to be 2,700. Yeah, well, it was actually, it was so, it, it, it was. supposed to draw or lose to them. It, it was so bad that he withdrew from the tournament. Uh, just oh, lo- losing to me was so. He, so. he lost to the puny little eye. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going home, and I'm not coming back. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna come back ever again. Yep, you you got me out of here. And by the way, did did you ever meet um, Goofeld in Southern California? Oh my God, I, I, Goofeld, uh, he Goofeld was a guy. He, he was a friend of mine, and I, I use it with quote. I just wrote an article for a book, like uh, a, a humor, like a humor stories book, like where it's a bunch of contributors. And mm. I wrote my article on Goofeld. Oh, I'll okay. tell you about the article, okay? Goofeld was my, quote, friend. He, he was like one of the most obnoxious humans on Earth. But as I said, I have this uh, genetic disability where I like everyone. Sure. And for, for some reason, I liked him for his obnoxiousness. Somehow it, well, he could be funny, maybe, or... Yeah, it was. I, I found him hilarious. And I I, I've him. heard some really funny stories about Goofeld, which are just like... They, they they almost parallel like I don't know the Emery Tate stories where it's like you just love the guy. He was the king. Yeah. He was the king of obnoxious things to do. One time, like first he okay every freaking tournament you know he would go ah Cyrus and then he would like rush up to me and grab me so I had no chance of escape like put his arm around me you know like like a father with his beloved only only son yeah. He had no hope of escape like. Sure. Okay. So it, okay, there's that. 
And then um, <clears throat> I'm playing in, in this uh, game. You know what? One of those tournaments where the first day is rapid and then you join the slow. Oh, tournament. right, right, right. Like, we're playing the game one version. Okay. Uh, by the way, I just like totally owned him. I beat him like almost every game we ever played. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, there was just something about his style. I found it really easy to beat him. But, maybe he um, maybe he was too too aggressive. He weakened himself too, too much. He, Overextended. I beat I beat aggressive players. Anyone who comes after me, I tend to win. It's it's the the more Carpovian players that are more difficult. Yeah, I have a lot of. Tr- I, I actually hardly ever lose, but my my weakness is beating weaker players. Uh, uh-huh. I, I have a terrible time beating weaker players. Now the, the aggressive guys do beat me, but they sure. lose more mm. when they go after me like mm-hmm. that. A- anyway, we're playing in the tournament, okay? So we're in a time scramble. Like we each have about uh, you know one minute left on our clock with time delay, okay? So what he does is <clears throat> he makes a move, okay, which is an okay move. Punches his clock, then he he like unpunches his claw, restarts his clock, takes his move back, makes another move, and punches his clock. And I'm going, WTF, you know, like, what, what's going on here? But then I realize, hey, his new move is a maiden. Th- I could mate him in three moves. I see maiden three. So I accept his new move. Okay? I like I, I like it. Let him do it. Oh. And so then I made him. And then in the middle of the turn, I mean, everybody's in a time scramble. Okay? Uh-huh. Like, 300 people in the room, 400 people yeah. in the room. Major tournament. Okay. Time scramble happening. Which okay. tournament was this? I can't remember. It's like... it's LA uh, Open it's or in something? LA and it was in 2000. I do remember it was 2000. Big tournament in, in LA in 2000. It could have been Memorial Day. It could have been anything. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly... I just can't remember the tournament. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, I can't even remember because I didn't even write down the name. All it says is Los Angeles 2000 on my... Hmm. in my chest space, like what it, when I entered it. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, uh. Um, <clears throat> anyway, it may have been 90, it may have been 99, actually. This is how great my memory is now. Yeah, I mean, Goofel died anyway, in 2002. Anyway, yeah. uh, so, the top of his lungs, he goes, Director! The entire tournament is like glaring at me. And, you know, autistic people, the worst thing that can happen is you're the center of attention, okay? Like, the, the, that's the, the thing mm. you dread more than anything, especially if people get angry at you. Uh. Everybody's angry. The entire tournament, like, hundreds of people, they're like, quiet, shush, you know? But he's still yelling, director! <laughs> the director comes over, and basically, he tells the director, the mate is illegal because I took back a move. So... My the, the the move I took back is an illegal move, and you as the director, it's your responsibility to make me play the first move, and therefore the make doesn't count. So basically, he's saying I want to take back on my take back. Okay, uh, and director John Hillary, the late John Hillary, just like like he started laughing, and he said, "Are you serious?" And um, okay, Goofelt was a very bad guy to laugh at, by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> I bet. And then he yelled at the top of his lungs, "This is not chess!" <laughs> at the top of his lungs, like, and I'm, I look like, I'm look, like, I'm thinking, is it possible to die of shame? <laughs> I made it the first guy in history. I just dropped dead of pure shame, you know. Like, I, I was embarrassed for the rest of the tournament. It actually threw my entire tournament. I could not recover psycho- psychologically from that. I, I was so traumatized wow. by the entire tournament looking at me that I played like crap for the rest of the tournament, you know? Wow. <clears throat> that's that's a pretty intense... Uh, yeah, I mean, because I just knew... I mean, just from the area you were in, I was assuming you knew Goofel. I didn't know you had, you know... Oh, no, no, no. We knew... Oh, my God. He would, like, uh, like if I played the Scandinavian... Okay, I, I'm a Scandinavian expert, okay? I played the Scandinavian. The Queen takes D5 Scandinavian. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, my God. Like... Goofel would go ape shit. You know, he would grab me after the game and tell me, why are you bring out Queen early? And then he, he would go into his usual spiel. It, it would be, um, <clears throat> what was it? In, okay, he would say, like, in opening, King is baby. You must protect baby. <laughs> like, I'm going, dude, the Scandinavian is playable. Yep, yep, not uh-huh. playable. 
people, you know, so it's like, like I, it's like I have to explain my openings to him, you know, somehow. Uh-huh. Like, uh-huh. I'm not allowed to play what I want to play, you know, like, oh my God, he got, like, um, one time at the American Open, we, I played at Alakin's defense on him, and he, he just, that was the American Open, by the way, which I won, uh, okay, uh-huh. and he, he's like shaking his head, bad move, Cyrus, bad move, this is during the game, okay, yeah. like, you're not supposed to talk to the guy that you're playing, and tell just him tell him it's a bad shit, move, right? yeah, shit. I mean, so, <laughs> Yeah, well, to, I I have a I have a very big heart for the players like that who uh, I don't know always had the the funniest and most interesting stories about them. I it, love them too because they produce stories. Yeah, they make chess so chess exciting. Is, yeah, they make chess fun. I, I know. Him, I loved him. Yeah, but he he was officially the most obnoxious human on earth. I mean, at the time. He really was like, I mean, he just wanted everything his way. Uh-huh. I've never met a person like that. You know? like, really? Wow. <laughs> that, that's incredible. And um, just have a couple more questions here. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see if these will be easier to answer. Uh, favorite opening? Um, well, is black or white? Uh, black. Let's start with. I would say Scandinavian because mm. I always get my Karo Khan position every time. Mm. You know, the pawns on but but why not the Karo Khan then? Because ah, because of people like you, Eric, who play that crazy knight nice <laughs> Yeah, I, I I was like I was really surprised that I was able to catch you in that, and I was like, wow, this is the best position I'll ever get against him, and I didn't win it. Oops. <laughs> so. But see, that's the reason uh, uh, the, the, the Scandinavian always wins because. The duller the position, the more likely I am to beat you. Okay. Uh-huh. The more rigid, and if any pieces get off, my rating like rockets in any ending. My mm. rating like rockets two hundred points. Mm-hmm. As soon as things come off, I just go, oh, thank God, you know, like, okay, now I can't lose, you know. Like, <laughs> but if queens are on, I'm just in mortal danger every game. Yeah. But Scandinavian, because I always get that bishop on f5, the pawn on e6, the pawn on c6. Essentially, essentially, it's a car prime variation. Where it's a classical car con every game. Where you where you've avoided the more troubling lines. I, I avoided the exchange line. I avoided the, the pan out Bodvinik mm-hmm. because that's, that's an open position. I, I yeah. you just drop my strength by 150 points by playing pan out Bodvinik. <laughs> yeah. You play your easy e5 knight c3 g4. Uh huh. Easy position. I don't like it. Yet, yet I don't want that. You know. So as long as I can have any stable position, like London with white, uh, Collie with white, Torre with white, like I can't mm. lose a Torre. I, I just can't yeah. really draw a win, you know? With London too, I just can't lose those. I draw a win. It yeah. Who I play, you well, know? you know, I also noticed that... I love too with black. I, I love Slob. It's just the stability well, of it. Were you happy to see Carlson playing some of those openings? I mean, like just the Collie and stuff like that? I love it because uh, they give it legitimacy. Yeah. I, I've never figured out oh, this bad rap for the collie. Like, it's like. Yeah, how could it be bad? To, I mean, like, cert- with certain openings, it's kind of like, how could it be. Semi Slav, and you, wow, what a hero you are. But you play the collie, and you play it in the semi Slav fashion. Yeah. Move yeah. up. Yeah. Oh, you effeminate little turd. I hate you. I hate you. It's re- the collie bad, but the semi Slav good. It's really strange. I found that to be very bizarre because there will be a lot of openings that if you reverse the colors, it's an aggressive, dynamic opening for someone with a great personality. It's like you're, yeah. you're, this, you're this little chicken shit who's the antithesis. I, I, I can't say the word right. You're yeah. The antithesis of... Uh, that, that's the reason I'm a writer, by the way, and why I hate interviews, because I can write antithesis. Yeah, I can't say, can't say it. it, yeah. Anyway... Uh, you, you're the antithesis of uh, everything that's noble in a soldier. Mm-hmm. Call, mm-hmm. okay? You're this cowardly, gutless draft dodger if you play the collie, but you're this noble war hero if you play to move down. It's a yeah, game. yeah. Like, if you play the Botvinnik semi-slav and memorize 35 moves like some of my IM yeah, friends I'm, do, then I'm just playing the same opening. It's the same thing. Down, yeah. You know, like yeah, well, well, also, I, I've been guilty of that from the black side where I see somebody play knight f3, b3 or something, and I'll go, I, I should totally beat this guy. 
And, and then what happens is we reach like a, a Queen's Indian where he's a tempo up. And then I realize, why am I not better? I, I should be better with black here. Why am I not better? And it's like, oh, logically, I have no reason at all to be better. So, of yeah, course, but, yeah. Like, yeah, I love B3, which is another opening people crap on. Uh, like, But Queen's Indian is perfectly playable. But sure. If you play B3, you're a jackass. <laughs> the, the stupidest review I've ever gotten in my life, I mean, one of the stupidest. I've had many incredibly stupid reviews, but... The, the Alkins defense one was one of them. But, okay, the, the stupidest review I've ever gotten in my life was the guy gave me three stars for the uh, my Nimzo Larson book, okay? and uh, Because it wasn't bold enough for her. I, I love the book, great writing, I loved everything about it, uh -huh. but B3 is a stupid opening, so I'm deducting <laughs> two stars. Like, Dude, uh, if I ever meet you in real life, I will break some bones, okay? Because people like you should not, should not be walking around on the earth. I do not deserve to be on the earth with someone as stupid as you. And but I, I thought... Me, I will break you in two. Okay? But I thought you were such a peaceful person on, I, I, on, I on Facebook yeah, and stuff. Buddhism and... really puts a damper on my natural instincts to, <laughs> to beat the crap out of people I dislike. You know? I, I practice, what I do is I I practice patience with people who I uh, dislike. Okay. I, I, I do meditational practice. Well, well, oftentimes, like, okay, oftentimes I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I mean, if if somebody really, I mean, I would say I probably have very few people who actually genuinely hate me, but there was a, you know, there was a guy I know who's a national master, and he, he said something like, oh, you know, the organization was horrible in the Kislik book. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear natural i mean like i'm happy to hear because i know i know it's it, it's absolutely nothing but i know but by the way but but anyway so you know because we had talked about how when you have the organization in your head the the map for the book then it's just you just fill it in and then it's like you know then it then you feel a sense of closure i guess with the book and so anyway but uh i i asked the guy and i was like okay so um, you know, this this was my point. I wanted to start from simplest things and then build up. I wanted to start off, you know, like with peace values and, and really simple things and then build up to a greater and greater understanding of how we can break down chess and apply logic in chess. And and he was like, uh, well, you know, uh, the book, uh, well, I lost it. So, uh, and I was like, you know, I'm not uh, challenging you. I'm not like attacking you or anything. And he, he really, like, he felt like he was really called out on it. And and I, I was... I have those all the time. I but, never respond. I, I never responded, by the way, ever. To no matter how oh. ridiculous the review, I never respond. By the way, I'm going to teach you something very important. Right now. I want you to take notes. I want you to remember this forever and ever. Okay? These are the basic uh, bad reviews. Okay? For me, at least. Uh, for me. Okay. Bad review number one. Chess is my religion. You used humor and colorful writing. Therefore, you're a blasphemer. I hate you. One mm -hmm. star or two mm -hmm. stars. Okay? You got hit with bad review number two. I'm stupid. Mm -hmm. I don't understand stuff in your book. Therefore, understand you why you did it. Review. Yeah. I'm stupid. Therefore, you get the bad <laughs> review. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about being stupid, but you have to suffer. Well, well also, also, I mean, he what he could have done is I was his I'm his Facebook friend. He could have just said, "Hey, you know, could you explain this to me?" I would I would have just you know sent him a one minute voice message and be like, he'd be in his reaction would have just literally would have been, "Oh, I get it now." Like, oh, it's 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 like what I thought. They overreact all the time, by the way, on Facebook. They, yeah. They take insults where none are given. No. You name calling and I, I think it's a really cowardly thing okay mm. as I mentioned you know like okay I'm an old man but I, I am six foot two I'm fat and muscular okay I work out every day at the gym <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm still I've got the knowledge of a fifth or sixth degree black belt sure okay, sure if you start cursing me to my face I will be very tempted to break your your nose okay or break your arm uh, like you're not gonna do that on Facebook because you, you mean in person in Australia oh yeah a plane ticket is just too expensive I <laughs> want to break your arm but the I have to buy a plane ticket I have to make reservations 
I have to hunt you down. I have to, you know, make like a hotel. It's just, it's a, I, I, you know, it's too I much work. In Australia, any way to break your arm, I have to stay there for a while. So I have to have like places to go and see. So I'm not going to break your arm if you're in Australia yeah. and you insult me. So it's a very cowardly thing. The way I, the way I see it is, <clears throat> I treat people on Facebook the way I would treat them face to face. I would never insult them oh, and okay. I would never I, I treat them everybody with respect even if I totally Trump supporter but you know I hate who you support but I respect you that's fine I, I respect you you know I, I never ever disrespect anyone mm-hmm. on purpose you know oh, okay um, but but Facebook and Twitter is the you know Instagram it's the it's the garden well it's I the, Playground for cowards. Well, oh my God! I just realized I I am at the I have to go see <laughs> I have lessons soon. I have to eat lunch and have lessons. And if I if I five minutes or three minutes or without <laughs> if I do the the lesson without lunch, yeah, I will be I will be a twelve hundred player. I'm already <laughs> interviewing right now at a. Uh, IQ 80 level because of my low blood sugar. Yeah, well, I, I guess I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll say one thing. Yeah, well, you mentioned like about different openings. So I, you know, like I, I, I gave a variation saying White was slightly better in the Queen's Gambit Accepted. And guess what happens? You have somebody who, who writes a book on the Queen's Gambit Accepted right. coming after me and writing bad reviews. Of, like, I, I, and it, it was just totally an accident. I did not mean any disrespect in any way to the Queen's Gambit Accepted, which I think is actually quite an enjoyable opening. And, and you know, then I have somebody who is writing books on the thing, and it's like, oh, no. It's like... It, Anger is not an external thing. Anger is an internal thing. Mm. I could have interpreted... Goofeld is as what an asshole. Okay, I could have interpreted it like that, but I didn't. I I found the guy completely delightful. Oh yeah. In my interpretation, it's how you. And a lot of people hated. Uh, you just hated, hated Goofeld. Goofeld. I, I remember Blotney once called him a fat pig one time, mm-hmm. and and while they were playing, and uh, Goofeld went berserk. You know, the director. You know, every, <laughs> game in the tournament hall stop you know? yeah you can, you can interpret it, it anger is not an external entity it's an mm. in, it's your perception of it yeah and someone i found that on facebook someone could get really angry with me and if i give a very polite response and a very reasonable response their anger just diminishes yeah and suddenly we become friends yeah i i think i i do honestly feel that kindness and communication are really crucial and like i said <laughs> It's everything. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I kind of noticed. I mean, I think what happened was the guy who was like, you know, saying, saying like, this is the stupidest organization. You know, like when I <laughs> just said a few things, I guess he didn't think I was gonna ask him about it, and it, it, it didn't really matter to me either. Um, right. But but then he was like, you know, I, 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 and he may have just done that as like a passive aggressive thing too. You never know when people just want to like insult just for no real reason. Um, just like you said, the cowardly thing. But you know, if, if like you said, it is all internal. If it's other people's prerogative, and my idea is just basically, I, I want to reach as many people and help them how, out however I can. And, and let la- yeah, that's yeah. what I'm trying to do. Last thing, I'll, last thing I'll say is your books too. You know, you're a teacher in your books too, not just in your lessons. True. You may even reach many more people than your lessons. Oh, I think I think I I will. And what 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 books of yours would you recommend most highly to somebody who doesn't know you or hasn't read your material? Well, Chess for Hawks one best instructional book for yeah. 2017 American Chess Journalists Association. Yeah, I was going to uh, mention that one, the Winning Ugly right, book, or me? would you put the Winning Ugly book up there as one of your top uh, recommendations? It's a very eccentric book. It has the craziest. Uh, it has the craziest craziest uh, lines e4 f6 that I've ever picked. <laughs> I have a game in there where Morphe is white yeah. and Barnes in yeah. a match game. Yeah. Morphe z4 Barnes plays f6 crushes Morphe. But but you know I'll... completely flustered <laughs> But but a lot of people, I mean, I like those. I don't know if you read those Amatia Avni books. I think those were some of the most underrated books. Creative Chess, Devious Chess. They're pretty short books. They're like 200 pages. I recommend if you... It's, if it's you, one of my most fun and most creative books, Winning Ugly. Uh, for my, my favorites for uh, my... Um, 
uh, Everyman books are, are my player books. I love my Capablanca book, although oh. the analysis is, of course, crap since 2000, in 2011. And your, yeah. your machine now will be 400 points stronger, and you'll find 500 errors in the analysis. Sure, you know? sure. But uh, I, I loved writing uh, the Capablanca book. That was my favorite book oh. to write. You know? I'm writing one now on winning streaks for New and Chess. Oh, yeah. Where I'm, I'm starting with Morphe. Oh. Like, basically, I'm, I'm doing their peak performance tournament or match. Oh. I start with Morphe, 1857, uh, American Chess Congress, where he wiped everyone out. Paulson was like a very distant second. And then I go to Steinitz, where he beat uh, Blackburn 7-0. Now, Blackburn was ranked number two in the world, okay? Like, that's like yeah. Paulson beating Carolina 7-0 in a slow match, okay? Yeah. It's not going to happen anymore, you know? Yeah. But it, but it was amazing the way Steinitz did it. I mean, mm. you know, defensive technique. Pawn grabbing, mm. I love pawn grabbing. And they, they go all the way to Carlson Granke. Oh, the big tournament. Who, who do you think is basically play like a computer? You know. Yeah. Who Who do you think is uh, most likely to be the next challenger for for Magnus or in the next couple of years? Would you say someone like Artemiev, maybe come up and comer? He's like I not. Keep him on IC, on IC <laughs> a year ago. So hey, that means I'm the the next challenger. Mm -hmm. uh, no, well, I don't know. There's so many gift. There's so much in gifted youth. It could be 15 different people. Yeah. You know, it, it literally could be 15 people, and it could be someone you you've not even heard of. Or he's under the radar right now, but yeah. explodes 300 rating points in the next uh, two years. You know, I I don't know. I, I I'm thinking it could be. Um, uh, Wang Yu, uh, not Wang Yu. Yeah. Yu. You, no, you, Yang, yeah, 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 I actually just posted about a game. Loses a game. Like, how do you beat him? You know? He is, he, and, and what some of those guys have, which really amazes me, is like, I, I think the people who are scared of Carlson, just, sorry, they just don't have a chance against him, but right. the people who yeah. are like, zero, zero, zero chance. chance, but the people who are poised, who really believe that they can do it, I mean, like, think right. about, like, look at the game Carlson lost to Bu Zhang Zi. I mean, right. Bu Zhang Zi right. won with Black in a beautiful game, and I it, have that in my E4 repertoire book. That's the first game in the book, I believe. Nice. I mean, I, I, yeah, that's a, I think that's the first game in the book. Maybe. Yeah, I did. I did. I, I did a little kind of uh, comical article called "How to Beat Magnus Carlsen," and it was in Chess Magazine, and that was one of the that was one of the games that was in there. I just submitted three articles to Chess. Yeah, I, I love the magazine. The three. I don't know if they'll accept them because they. I told them these are already written for rank and file, but uh, okay. there's almost no crossover. Th there's very little. There's very little, yeah, little I'm crossover. Who's gonna read chess? Who reads rank and file, right? So, and I'm, I'm good friends with Richard Palliser. Yeah, Palliser is a fantastic guy. He's, he's my editor. I mean, he was one of my oh. editors. Oh, uh, okay. Every man, and he, we've been good friends for many, many years. Yeah, you know? he's, he's a wonderful human. Great, being, you know? great. Okay, I, okay, I really got to get going. Let my people go, man. <laughs> Okay, like, Carol, <laughs> let my people go. I have a lesson in 55 minutes. Got to make lunch. Got to eat lunch. Got to get ready for lessons. <laughs> okay, I'll shut this off. Okay. Hold on. I just, okay. I, I just, hold on. I just. It's wonderful meeting you. Thank you so much for the interview.